hearing of the Boston City Council's Ways and Means Committee to order. Um, for the record, my name is Kenzie Bach. I'm the District 8 City Councilor and also the Chair of the Ways and Means Committee. Uh, this hearing is being recorded. It's being live streamed at boston.gov slash city-council-tv and broadcast on Xfinity Channel 8, RCN Channel 82, and Fios Channel 964. It's part of the um, 35 working sessions and hearings that the Council is hosting on different aspects of the City's budget um, proposed for FY22. You can find that full hearing schedule at boston.gov slash um, council-budget, boston.gov slash council-budget. Um, and you're always welcome to testify at the end of these department hearings. So you can find out how to do that at boston.gov slash budget-testify. Um, you can also shoot us an email at ccc.wm, ccc.wm for ways and means at boston.gov. Um, and we'll take written testimony. Um, you can go online and upload a video, which we can play at the end of um, a hearing. Uh, or you can come and join us in the Zoom, as I see a few people have today, um, and testify in person. Uh, we're also having two dedicated hearings focused on public testimony, one on May 25th at 6 p.m. focused on BPS, and one on June 3rd at 6 p.m. focused on any aspect of the budget. So folks are welcome to that. Um, and uh, yeah, or tweet at us with the hashtag boss budget, BOS budget, and we'd love to hear from you. Today's hearing is on docket 0524 to 0526, orders for the FY22 operating budget, including annual appropriations for departmental operations for the school department and for other post employment benefits. Docket 0527 to 0528, orders for capital fund transfer appropriations. Docket 0529 to 0531, orders for the capital budget, including loan orders and lease purchase agreements. And docket 0537, order authorizing a limit for the Boston Center for Youth and Families revolving fund for FY22. Um, and this is our hearing focused on BCYF, also known as Boston Centers for Youth and Families. Um, and we're joined here today by the BCYF Commissioner, William Morales, uh, Varney Jules, the Finance Manager, um, and also, I think, um, supported by Todd McDonough from um, PFD. So grateful to all of them. Um, grateful also to my colleagues who are with us, Councillor Michelle Wu at large, Councillor uh, Liz Braden, District 9, and Councillor Matt O'Malley, District 6. Um, and uh, yeah, and without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to Commissioner Morales and we'll, we'll jump right in. Commissioner, you're muted. I think that's going to be everybody's new last name, right? You muted, right? We're all going to be muted. Uh, I want to thank you all for giving me this opportunity, especially you, Councillor Bach. Uh, just to make a quick correction, uh, Pat McDonough is actually with uh, BCYF as the facility director, not with P PFD. Uh, even though I think he lives there more than, than he lives here. Uh, but just wanted to make sure that we had that correction for the record. Uh, I want to thank you for this opportunity to present our BCYF uh, fiscal year 22 budget. Um, I am honored to be here before you as the commissioner of BCYF. I would like to thank uh, Mayor Janey for her support of BCYF. And I also like to thank Chief Martinez for bringing the human services cabinet together to ensure that we are working together and collaboratively on issues that are important to everyone in the city. Under his leadership, we have intentionally uh, been supporting and guiding some of the most vulnerable populations we serve towards better access to resources and information to help put them on the path towards stability. On top of that, I also want to thank all the 400 uh, employees that work for BCYF day in and day out. When COVID-19 hit, bringing in unforeseen issues and restrictions, we had to quickly shift from providing programs, events, and activities to helping our families with the most basic needs. Some of those things that we transitioned into doing were distributing over 200,000 meals at 17 youth meal distribution sites, along with four adult meal distribution sites as well. We delivered over 1,300 meals to financially challenged and homebound residents throughout the city. We supported multiple city departments with translation services, assisting residents to help access employment benefits and developing and releasing the BCYF needs assessment survey to help us prioritize our initiatives going forward through this pandemic. We distribute over 2,000 BCYF family care packages. And with the support of the Red Sox, we provided some back to school totes to for many of our students in our neighborhoods. And when things started to look better, as we approached last summer, we set up safety protocols as well 
and registration system so that we can open our outdoor pools and offer in-person and virtual programming. Just being able to provide a little bit of normal for our families gave us all the boosts that we needed. I would like to take a minute to just share some of the other accomplishments in this fiscal year. We served over 3,500 participants during the summer, utilizing not just our indoor spaces, but outdoor spaces too. We offered programming for teens, including girls programming, and our popular Super Teens program, which is a pre-employment program, which serves 300 youth between the ages of 12 to 14 years of age. Normally that's the age group that I always say that they're too cool for camps, but they're still too young for summer jobs. We're able to benefit from the caring and consistent mentorship of young people in the city, uh, in the city of Boston. We are about to launch our new membership system that meets our data and operational needs and provides constituents and members with better service, integrates more seamlessly with other BCYF and City of Boston systems, and will be able to grow our chain, uh, will be able to help us grow and change as we do. During fiscal year 21, we worked with the vendor to build out that system, train our staff using it so they are ready when we fully migrated it, migrated it in May. Additional features will be rolled out during the fiscal year of 22. We expanded access to technology to enhance our programming during COVID restrictions, including supplying hotspots, laptops, and in partnership with Comcast, offering free Wi-Fi at all our centers. We completed a strategic planning process, securing input from the people, partners, and community members who know us best and are now working on the implementation phase of working groups uh, in the implementation phase. Our working groups are focusing on capital assets, human capital strategy, communications, outreach, and partnership services, and organizational structure processes as well. Now I will mention just a few of the new initiatives we have planned for fiscal year 22. We are removing the center membership fees uh, this is something that we piloted during COVID-19 and are going to continue. We are creating a new and diverse career pathways program for our SOAR participants, a uh, program formerly known as the Boston Street Programs, in order to provide better support and career opportunities that help participants in that program attain and sustain meaningful lifelong employment. We will continue with the implementation phase of the BCYF strategic plan develop anchor gender specific programs ad addressing self-esteem, college prep, leadership, STEM, mental health at seven BCYF centers to support the administration's effort to help close the, uh, the gap, uh, close the gender gap. We are continuing the capital investments in BCYF facilities with renovations to the BCYF Curly, Matterhunt, Rosendale Community Centers, Paris Street Pool, along with the reallocation studies for new community centers in Austin Brighton, Charlestown, and Dorchester. Partnering with the foundation for BCYF, we continue to identify and engage strategic partnerships and secure new large institutional sponsors and financial supporters to support the important work that we do. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak with you today. It's an honor to be working for a mayor and working with a city council that is committed to working with us to create centers that are centered on transformative relationships. And I look forward to discussing our proposed fiscal year 22 budget with you now. Great, thank you so much, Commissioner. Um, and uh, thank you also to my colleagues who joined right after I did the summary. So also joined by Councillor Anissa Asabi george at large and uh, Councillor Andrea Campbell, District 4. Um, we're, we'll jump straight into questions. Um, really appreciate the presentation. And uh, I'll, um, I'll defer mine. So we'll go first to Councillor Michelle Wu. Thank you very much, um, Madam Chair. Thank you so much, Commissioner and um, everyone here. Um, just curious to get your thoughts about um, this upcoming summer, um, especially with the um, mental health strain of so many students and young people facing isolation and now all of a sudden a, a return to um, a, maybe a little bit more um, of, of being able to see people. What 
how are you thinking about the, you know, especially as the fiscal year is kind of spanning across uh, or ending and for the first half of the summer yeah. and then more, how are you thinking about resources needed for this summer and what programming might look like? Okay, uh, I, I think we, we want to hopefully look at being as normal as possible, right? We want to make sure people, especially young people, come back to something that's familiar and not something that's sort of over-programmed or over-protocol that at the same time it makes them feel confined. I think that uh, our team has really been carefully looking at how do they develop strong safe measures but to ensure that we can deliver strong programming. I mean, one of the great things I think that's happened is that we had to reinvent ourselves as a department. And so we've always found creative new ways to try to continue to engage young people. Partnerships with uh, Parks and Recs provided us access to public parks that allowed us to, to, to meet our young people where they were uh, in a safe surrounding. But I think that we are ready and able to really begin to look at um, our programming, one that will feel as normal as possible, even though we're still living underneath a COVID reality. Um, I know that our team continues to work uh, looking at various regulations, because as you know, uh, we have summer camp programs, we have EEC programs, uh, and then we also have a municipal kind of exemption. And what we're trying to do with all three is to make sure that all three are able to operate within our spaces, but uh, uh, in, a, in a way that will be seamless so that when our young people and our families return back, they can feel like, wow, this is a big step forward in getting us to feel comfortable and, and, and normal again. Uh, but, you know, I think that you know, BCYF learned a lot last summer compared uh, to many of our uh, nonprofit partners who unfortunately did not maybe have the capacity to serve young people. Uh, you know, we 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 jumped uh, forward and say we need to offer something. And in that process, we learned what we can do, how we can do it and, and do it well. I think that the goal for this summer is to continue to reconnect, re-engage. Uh, we're no longer in response. We're in recovery. And what we want to make sure that recovery is is going to be a process and where we can serve more families, more youth, more frequently. And um, is, I don't know if this is the right space or there's going to be yeah. later budget conversations about this, but in terms of the um, federal funding and sort of dream projects, uh, particularly around infrastructure, one-time things, um, what's the sort of moonshot of what would be the, the ideal um, if you all could have first pick of uh, the, the pool of funding, for example, what would be um, ideal for from your perspective? I think that we want to basically look at re-engagement, you know what I mean, and engage our families and engage our youth again. Uh, at the same time, re-engage them with new tools of engagement, because, you know, one of the things that did happen is that even though we got the additional hotspots and we had great relationship with Comcast, there's still so much more that we can do with technology. And I think that, as we know, uh, we're seeing a really move towards the engineering field for a lot of young people. You know, they are being very creative. They're being wizards. Uh, I think ideally, you know, um, as we move forward, we want to see some initial more investments um, in regards to support that, um, at that work. Um, but at the same time, also look at looking at how we can also support some of our other partners in our neighborhoods too as well that have been you know deeply uh, hurt by uh, hurt or impacted by the pandemic you know as we all know you know you have dorchester youth collaborative that's no longer here uh, who knows how many other mom and pop organizations that did meaningful work might not be able to operate so we're going to be looking at our backyards and looking at what happened what is no longer there and seeing how we can support in, in the best capacities we have uh, with any kind of funding that we get, federal or whatever, to help support the recovery and the re-engagement efforts in our neighborhoods. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, Madam, um, not Madam Chair, that's me, um, <laughs> Councillor Wu. Um, all right, uh, up next is Councillor Liz Braden, and we've also been joined by um, Councillor uh, Julia Mejia at large. Um, Councillor Braden. Thank you, thank you for your presentation. Um, thank you, and thank you for all the great work you did during the, the pandemic. As you say, we're in recovery mode now. Um, um, I know we've had conversations before. Um, I really want to drill down a little on um, just, we are closing our community center in Alston Brighton next July. Um, I wonder um, in terms of covering all the services that are provided there, what is, um, um, how are we going to do that? Like the, um, 
and this is getting into the weeds a little, and I know we can have an offline conversation, but mm -hmm. I really want to flag it up that this is a hugely big um, concern in the neighbourhood because uh, the BCYF centre in Alston Brighton was the only one we have at the Jackson Man. It's the only centre. It is a, a polling place for five precincts. And so in a, in a big election, there's, there's hundreds of people queued down the street. So we're going to have to think about elections. We're going to think about cooling centres. We're going to think about all the, the different pieces of service that, that that facility allows us to provide to our community. So I really want to know what's the plan. I don't want us to leave it to July next year to figure out, scratch our head and say, oh, now what are we going to do? I want us to have a plan like early next year that we know that we have a path and that we, we know where all these different services are going to be provided, even if they have to be splintered up across the neighbourhood. And I also would love a timeline for when we can foreseeably see a replacement uh, community centre constructed. Like, that's a huge site there. There's two schools and a community centre. Mm -hmm. It seems like a, it's a really central location with really good bus service. Uh, it seems like an obvious place to rebuild. But, um, you know, the neighbourhood is pushing me on wh what's happening, when's it going to happen, what, what are we going to do about this? And 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 the timeline is sort of a critical piece. Um and then the other issue that's come up in relating, relating to uh, basically we need to have some sort of sustainable uh, uh, support for youth services for our young people who live at Commonwealth Housing and Fidelis Way and also at Faneuil Gardens. Um, our, some of our legislative um, delegates uh, to the state uh, um Councillor, uh, Senator um, Brownsberger appropriated funds to help with youth workers, but we can get money. But throwing money at the problem isn't the isn't the issue. We need a dedi We need some agency in the city to take responsibility for providing or supervising youth workers, or even having a resident services provide. Um, and this is a this is sort of a dovetailing into BHA, but. A resident services coordinator who can actually coordinate a youth youth worker or some youth youth services going in. We have about four hundred to four hundred to five hundred kids in those two um, uh, those two areas in Fidelis and, and Faneuil. The the the, the COVID uh, pandemic has been horrendously stressful for them, and kids are getting into serious trouble. And for a place that we didn't see too much trouble, we're sliding. And I'm really concerned that if we don't step up and put serious consideration into providing youth services, that those kids are going to get into more trouble and um, that just the quality of life for everybody concerned is going to go downhill. So, you know, uh, those are the two big issues. You know, what are we going to do with the centre? And then this issue around our youth services for these two, um, for Fidelis and Faneuil are a huge concern for our neighbours and especially for the residents of those uh, of Fidelis and uh, Faneuil. Thank you. <laughs> Sounds great. I'll, I'll try to tackle both of them as, as best as I can. I think we've had conversations on both and I think they are definitely on our radar. Um, of course, Jackson Man has been a big one that we have been uh, always putting before uh, the mayor's office um, as, as, a, as, a, as a priority. Uh, for the department and you are correct compared to many of the communities that we serve uh we have at minimum two community centers you know what i mean in some other parts of the city um you know when you look at jamaica plain and you look at east boston those are examples of when you're looking at similar size communities uh there are two uh, i think that what we've been doing is that you know during the period of COVID and the period of course the transitions of mayors and so forth we kept this uh, issue um, uh, up in the air uh, just recently, I had met with uh, uh, Chief Irish to talk about this this particular issue. Um, as you're very much aware, this year's fiscal budget, there is a feasibility study that that has been uh, approved through the uh, well, well, hopefully we'll get approved <laughs> through this budget process, and that will begin to begin to look at what uh, spaces or lots might be available uh, for a sort of standalone facility in in the Austin Brighton neighborhood. Uh, but at the same time, one of the things that we did have a conversation about is to look at what is the available swing space that might be there temporary, because we just know that the feasibility study only tells us where we may plant a, a community center, uh, but it will then take another process to actually 
uh, put in the budget, uh, the budget dollars that will be needed to actually build the facility. And that within itself is gonna take uh, its time and its processes to do that. Uh, and I think that right now, especially speaking with our administrative coordinators, um, our leadership at the center, you know, I think that the key thing that we want to do is that we want to just make sure that we have a sustainable presence during uh, that uh, during the meantime, after July 22nd, that would allow us to continue to run the most crucial programs um, that that community depends on that community center to provide. And I think when you're looking at adult ESL classes being one of the key programs, when you're looking at uh, the EEC after school programs, those are things that I think we're going to have to pull in other departments in, maybe Boston Public Schools, uh, you know, of course, PFD, uh, any viable property that the city might own to think about how we might be able to plant some of those programs. Normally, when we've done some construction projects, um, like the Curly and, and Rosendale and et cetera, uh, some of that program shifts to other locations. Not 100% of our programs come over, but we make sure that the key crucial programs actually do. Uh, I think that in the weeks to come, we'll definitely formulate that. Uh, this is definitely a priority. I know that, um, and speaking to Chief Irish and uh, new director, uh, uh, Kerry Griffith, you know, they're going to hopefully make sure that this thing gets pushed uh, along um, as, as, as fast as possible in regards to the uh, feasibility study. And hopefully we'll be begin to hopefully formulate a plan and hopefully keep your office in the loop, uh, 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 Council Breeden, because uh, you have been strong, a strong advocate and BCYF has appreciated your support around this matter. And I think that hopefully we'll get to, to a better place that by hopefully July 22nd, we'll have a good idea where our programs might be able to uh, exist on the temporary basis while we're working on a long-term sustainable plan uh, for that community in Austin Brighton. Uh, I think the second part of it, I know we've had internal conversations uh, looking at Faneuil, looking at um, the Dallas Way. We know that there's been transition there too as well. Commonwealth is no longer there. Now BHA is actually operating it. Um, and to really begin to look at what other partners are, are also offering, looking at what the West End and the, and the Boys End, uh, excuse me, the West End and the YMCA um, is doing. It might be that we might have to take a sort of maybe targeted outreach approach to it. Um, but at the same time, to also look at uh, who, who, who might be looking at being the lead agency that can provide that support. Because uh, the one thing is that you could, you're right, you could plop in a youth worker in there, but if they have no support, um, yeah. you know, and, and additional tools, then it makes their hard, it makes their job a little harder. And if you know young people, young people are always looking and asking for things. <laughs> and if you don't deliver, you lose your credibility with them. And so one of the things that I think we'll, we'll, we'll look at, um, especially in, in the weeks to come, is to look at how we maybe look at dealing with the issue now for this summer temporary, but then to look at what's the long-term plan moving forward. And we've had some collaborative um, partnerships with the BHA, especially in the Bromley Heath area that tends to be one of the housing developments that's mostly impacted by violence. And we've worked with uh, Children's Hospital and they've provided through the foundation some funding that allows us to put uh, some youth workers there but it's managed with the Tree of Life, which is a no neighborhood organization that works in the development that provides the youth workers with the supervision, but also the additional support. And I don't know if that model might be a model that works, but we wanna make sure that whatever model we create, that it's created in partnership with the residents there, with the parents there. Uh, nothing is, is more hurtful when somebody parachutes in without talking yes. to the people who are in. It's yeah. better to build a, a strong youth model from the inside out, not from the outside in. Yeah, I agree. And we have been in long conversations, I'd say for the last six months or so, we've been talking to the residents in both those um, facilities to try and identify, but there is a huge level of concern. I appreciate your, your attention to this yep. and, um, you know, I'm not going to go away. I'm going to keep pushing you on this. Uh, so, okay. uh, I kind of it. Liz, if you know Barbara Pecci, who lives in the neighborhood, who happens yes. to be my regional operation manager, she does not let this thing go away. So I got to God bless her for always making sure that she's a strong advocate uh, for, her, for her own home neighborhood, uh, mm -hmm. but especially because she knows the families who live there. Yeah, there appreciate neighbors. that. Yep. Thank you, um, Madam Chair. I'm sure my time is up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Braden. Um, no, I think we all know how pressing um, figuring something out for the Jackson Man is. Yeah. Um, also, sorry, I'm shrouded in darkness today, so people are going to have to still see my gavel, despite <laughs> the lack of color contrast. Um, 
All right. Uh, and we were joined, sorry, I neglected earlier to say as well by uh, Councillor um, Frank Baker. Um, and uh, next up now is Councillor Matt O'Malley, and then it'll be Penny Sotasabi George. Councillor O'Malley. Thank you, Madam Chair, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's great to see everybody. Uh, Commissioner Morales, uh, thank you for uh, great leadership in an unimaginably challenging year, uh, as I have said publicly and privately, and will will repeat. Uh, we one thing that really impressed me um, were how nimble so many um, of our my fellow public servants were, uh, folks at all aspects of city government, and none more than. Uh, members of BCYF, you know, just the fact that, that so many sites were immediately transformed into uh, food uh, pickup uh, sites, as you had noticed in your opening remarks, it was uh, it was really well done, and 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 kudos to you uh, and your team uh, again for being so uh, adaptable to the uh, challenges that a year and a half ago would seem completely outside the realm of possibility. Um, obviously, it goes without saying, my, my deep uh, love and appreciation for all the BCYF facilities and staff in my district, of which there are many. And I have some uh, district-specific questions, but first I just want to go over, and this may be for uh, Varney or Pat to jump in as well. Um, I'm delighted to see that utilities are the driving cost of decrease. Line item 52200 is uh, showing a 26% decrease in utility costs, which uh, it turns out to just about $375,000. Um, why is that? It's good news is the, is the punchline, but why, why are we seeing such a dramatic decrease in utility costs? Well, Pat might be able to add more, but you know, we have been um, one of the departments that have been really strong in participating in some energy saving uh, initiatives. Uh, we have a few buildings that have solar panels that are, that are laid out. Um, so we're, we're seeing uh, energy savings in, in that aspect. Uh, um, and Pat's team continues to work with a lot of our facility staff to look at what other cost, cost measures we can do to make sure that our buildings are running efficient, uh, having what they need, but at the same time, making sure that we're controlling the cost as, as much as possible. Uh, you know, we know that, um, you know, we can't, we can't be a, a strong advocate for the environment if we ourselves are not <laughs> practicing that within our own halls. So, um, and Pat, Pat can share a little bit more too, if, if he wants, Pat. Yes, yep, hi, Council. Hi, hi, thanks, Commissioner. And uh, Councilor O'Malley, thank you very much. Yeah, we've been working with the uh, city's environmental department as part of the Renew Boston Trust, which started off as a $10 million initiative from Mayor Walsh. I believe now it's up to $30 million. And uh, we got in on the phase one, which of course, uh, over here at the Tobin building where our main offices are um, in Mission Hill, we had 2.1 million put into it with a new uh, HVAC and ventilation system. Timing's everything in life, of course, and uh, given what's happened in the last, you know, 15 months, six, 15, 16 months. And but we also put solar panels, as Will mentioned, on both sides of the gym. Um, in Rosendale Community Center, we also put, um, put them on the rooftop uh, over at Rosendale. We're hoping to put solar panels on more buildings. We've also done LED uh, energy efficiency um, retrofits here at the Tobin, at the Shelburne, at Curtis Hall, at the Flaherty Pool. Um, and uh, we're looking to do more of those in High Park Community Center also. So we're in phase two now with uh, working with Adam Mullen, who's at, uh, at the PFD Capital Project Manager uh, with PFD, with Honeywell and City Hall Environmental and um, the uh, with Chris Kramer, the Director of Energy. And, uh, and they're always checking stuff. I mean, we, they come out with the transformers, they come out with the, uh, the numbers. So I, this is a, a, a very big project and it doesn't end when you finish the actual construction. So, I mean, for instance, I know that uh, Pat Lee, who works with Adam at PFT Capital. And yeah. Honeywell, yeah. Right, Pat, I'm sorry, I'm just gonna cut you off just cause I only have a sorry. couple. I don't right. want to know about energy efficiency. Sorry, Councilor. No, no, no. I, I could listen to this all day long, um, and I appreciate this. And obviously, it underscores the point about the savings that, that any municipality can see. So there is a plan to see increased PV panels on more. Uh, I mean, the, the bottom line is I know the answer is yes, and we're going to have to talk about retrofitting these buildings. But um, do you can you share publicly with uh, sort of what the next staggered buildings will be that will see PV panels? I know Curtis Hall in my district was in the mix. I'd argue Roach Center would be another ideal candidate. Yeah, I think I think what it is, Councilor. The short answer is is that the uh, we are definitely looking at all the buildings. It's it's about viability and it's about um, it's about energy efficiency and savings also. Sure. So I think at some point all of them are going to get it. I think it's just I'm not sure what the order is right now. 
Okay. I mean, again, uh, just more curious than anything else because that's uh, that's good news indeed. Um, other uh, sort of specific line items, it, it's essentially level funded, but to offset the 375000 in utility savings is a $400,000 increase in, um, I think it's contracted uh, services uh, uh, staffing, $52,900. Um, briefly, can someone just explain what that is? But uh, the increase in what line item? It's 52900. Right, Ronnie can, where's Ronnie? She might be able to shine a little bit more light into it. If it's contractual. That's the contractual, sir. Hi. Good morning, go, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. Yeah, that's the 529 line, the uh, contracted services line. And um, the increase in spending is basically um, due to the and we now we've taken the the funds from the sites and then we're spending more money in fixing things at the sites and things that the councils used to take care of before that we are doing we are reimbursing them mm -hmm. for expenses and uh, that of their copiers and other stuff but those are to go to copier account but the the five to nine line the co contracted services is basically we to retrofit some of our sites because of the covid we had to build uh, hire contractors to build wall separation walls for the um, the glass uh, um, partitions yeah. that we have at the site, and uh, and increase other uh, expenses that we had to do to in order to work and to make our sites uh, safe for uh, for the public, even for the food distribution. So, th so that's four hundred thirteen. Th and again, seems like a more than worthwhile expenditure. But four hundred thirteen thousand dollars was. Uh, mm -hmm. Funding for infrastructure and buildings to make it COVID safe. COVID, uh, yes, yes, most of that was part of yeah. that. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, and then um, I'm going to get right to some uh, district specifics because I know my colleagues have been waiting patiently. <laughs> um, excited to see, and I, and I will add my voice uh, to support Council Braden and Alston Brighton and the residents there as it relates to Jackson Man. But from my district, you know, I'm delighted to see a lot of expenditures uh, in the capital plan going forward. Uh, there doesn't seem to be any in District 6. And what I'm looking for isn't, I, I, I'm a realist and I recognize financial constraints. I don't need to say yeah. that we need to see a multi-million dollar commitment right now. What I do need to see is us being in queue, in the queue, in line, um, specifically for two. Uh, one is the Hennigan Community Center in the back of the hill, um, which is is beyond dilapidated at this point. People still use it, but it's just it's it's it needs so much work. Um, and then the second is getting at least a commitment for a standalone senior center in West Roxbury. Uh, Twenty five percent of West Roxbury residents are senior citizens. We have the highest percentage in the city by far. And while I recognize great work that's happening at the Orenberger. Um, in terms of some specific programming, as well as at the Roach Center. Um, there really needs to be a standalone facility. We've had sort of false starts and, and fits before going forward. But I guess my, my closing statement slash question is, I really want to see a commitment going forward that BCYF is going to invest, A, in the Hennigan, first and foremost, for JP, because it needs it. But secondly, having a standalone senior center. Um, again, just I want to know that, that the planning is there, the conversation is there, and we can really push forward. And my successor will hopefully be able to push forward going forward. So so, you know, if you had any comments on that, Will, or um, happy to happy to end it at that. Well, we can note the, the senior center. That's one thing, and then look at it uh, moving forward. And uh, and I think that when it comes to the Hennigan, I think that's a collaboration that we have to do with the uh, BPS. As you know, we share the building with BPS. It's BPS's capital budget uh, that normally takes care of their buildings. And I think we've done we were doing some pretty good work pre-COVID that we were having uh, some standing meetings, uh, observation meetings, walking through the spaces together. Uh, um, and I think that under uh, uh, Superintendent uh, Caselis's initiatives, I mean, she's looking at uh, all her sites being sort of warm and, and welcoming spaces. I think that Pat will probably continue to work with the facilities department to tackle some of the issues there um, and continue to hopefully make it a, a prominent space. Because we, we definitely know that it gets the heavy use, not only uh, by constituents in Jamaica Plain, but also by the kids who live right down the street in the Bromley, in the Mildred Haley uh, housing development as well. No, no, well said. Sounds like we're on the same page there. I look forward yep. to the conversation. Yep. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Matt. Great. Thanks so much, Council President. Um, uh, next up is uh, Councillor Asabi George, and uh, then it will be Councillor Campbell, Councillor Mejia, Councillor Baker. Councillor Asabi George. Thank you uh, very much, Madam Chair, and thank you, uh, Will, and your team for being with us today. 
My questions today are on three topics or three areas of your work, mm -hmm. store, uh, summer violence prevention, and then also the impact report uh, on that. One of the FY21 accomplishments listed was having that completed first BCYF impact report. Can you talk a little bit more about what that report shed light on and what were some of the findings and are we going to do that again? Are we looking forward to continuing that work or at least responding to some of the impact reports findings? And then obviously on uh, SOAR, looking for um, some of the results of the FY21 uh, budget commitment of $100,000 around violence prevention and um, the pilot program around pre-employment and job readiness training. And then obviously as we prepare for the summer, you know, these things are all, I think, interrelated as we prepare for the summer. Um, you know, what's the work being done around violence prevention and reduction as it relates to your work and BCYF's efforts? Okay, good. Uh, the summer, the impact report, I can get you a copy of it so that you can have, but I think what it did, it just really shined more of the work that the foundation helped fund and support in regards to BCYF. So it looked at a lot of our super teens initiative, understanding that that population is sort of a very underserved population, uh, but it's also the population that is trying to figure out who they are and who they, and, and what they want to be. Um, so I know that I can definitely hopefully get you a report that will illustrate that. Um, and it begins and it talks about some of the strategic investments that the foundation is making towards BCYF. We would never have been able to have a strategic planning process if we didn't have a funding source. And the foundation provided that funding source and made it very uh, uh, possible for us to have broader conversations with multiple stakeholders in all our communities to kind of do that work and, and get it out. It talked a little bit about our adult education programs, our girls initiatives, what we're doing with seniors. Um, it talked a little bit about um, uh, our percentage rates in, in regards to those participation levels that the foundation, for the, for the initiatives that the foundation uh, helped fund. So, um, uh, Councilor, I will definitely get you a copy and, and, and you will have it. And if you have any other follow-up uh, conversations in regards to it, it would be kind of great. But it talks a little great. bit a lot of the uh, central initiative programs that get funded through the foundation aspect of it. Um, you mentioned the 100,000 uh, in regards to the SOAR program and our violence. Uh, we recently have had our annual sort of summer uh, violence uh, prevention kind of meeting, uh, one that's actually coordinated through uh, Chief Martinez's office in partnership with the Office of uh, Public Safety uh, under uh, Dr. Falk. Um, and one of the things we do is that we look at making sure that we take a very collaborative approach when it comes to summer and violence. Uh, as you were very much aware last year, even though we were in the middle of pandemic, violence doesn't stop for a pandemic. And a lot of our SOAR and street workers continue to do that vital work. They continue to engage young people, even though they knew that they themselves might have put themselves in a very uh, compromising situation where they could be exposed uh, with COVID. I think that this year's uh, uh, initiative is looking at deepening more of our partnerships, uh, looking at how we could be more creative with our sites, looking at the hours of operation of our sites uh, to continue to hopefully do what we can to hopefully curb violence in our communities. But we hope that with the, the relifting of the restrictions, right, we also will see some of our partners opening up their doors and helping support some of those violence prevention efforts as well. I think that what we saw last year is that our partners did not have the capacity to open their doors, but we think that this year with their doors opening and with a little bit more support, we'll be able to hopefully do that. And as you're very much aware, you know, the BCYF provides a summer kind of fund, summer fund grants. Uh, one of the things that we did focus it on was looking at violence prevention, but also looking at it from a mental health standpoint, understanding that COVID fatigue was a real reality for a lot of our young people. Uh, Council Breeden mentioned uh, what that isolation has impacted our young people. And so we want to make sure that organizations that are going to be working with young people are looking at these issues carefully and to make sure that their programs are designed to response to any issue of violence that may happen in their community, not from a intervention standpoint, but a really strong prevention standpoint. Did you have thank another you. question? No, thank you very much All for right. that. No, so the SOAR and the summer violence certainly go together and that work is yeah. um, definitely like tied to each other. Um, yeah. I guess my, my one sort of a quick question 
there is a new data system that's being implemented to meet some of the operational needs and data yeah. needs. Could you just clarify some of the, the goals of that data system? Uh, to what extent is the data collecting being used in um, other BCYF systems or communication purposes? Could you talk just a, briefly about that? Yeah, sure. Uh, I think that what we had, we had a very dated system that probably went back, who knows, 18 years ago. Uh, when all we were looking was just counting numbers. Now we want to hopefully look at how do we count impact, right? And it provides us an opportunity to further engage and stay engaged with our constituents and see how our, even how our constituents are moving through our various facilities. Uh, the new data system will hopefully help us track our young people. I mean, I envision that if a young kid came to us, one of your even one of your own children at the age of 12 came to us as a super team. We can see them graduate to the DYE program, graduate into maybe a small summer seasonal employment program, and we'll be able to track how a healthy continuum, uh, how they move through our spaces and through a healthy continuum. I think that that's the thing that we didn't have before. One of the things is that BCYF is really known as one of the strongest organizations that partners with a lot of uh, nonprofits. Uh, but what happens is that we're also the best kept secret. And we don't want to be a secret anymore. And we know that the data will help paint the picture, provide the sketch, and show individuals about the impact of our work. Uh, great. And I see the gavel. I appreciate um, <laughs> the commentary on both of those things. And if I could just say out loud, and it's not a question, just a comment. I know that we're on the same page uh, with this. Let's just teach more kids to swim so oh, yes. that they can uh, be lifeguards uh summer jobs which i know are sometimes hard to find lifeguards that are, yeah. are trained but also it's a great life skill for our kids i uh, thank you madam chair and thank you commissioner and your team thank you great thank you councillor savvy george um next up is uh councillor campbell um, and then councillor mejia councillor baker councillor campbell Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and thank you, Commissioner, you and your team for the work you, you continue to do, particularly in COVID, has not been easy, of course, for anyone. Um, and you guys had to transition to some online services and all kinds of creative ways. So thank you and your team, um, and of, cor of course, your entire staff of folks who clearly aren't on this Zoom um, mm -hmm. for their service as well. Um, just a couple of questions. One is, Obviously, I've been in conversation with Mike Kozu and the Grove Hall community since the very beginning. And when the uh, Grove Hall Community Center was turned into pre predominantly for senior programming, which, of course, the feedback has been great, a lot of youth uh, then didn't really have uh, places to go or, you know, there was a push from the community to expand service and programming services and programming for youth. And so obviously now there is a. Uh, there was an update from the Public Facilities Department regarding a potential new site in Dorchester. I know there's going to be a community process, I think, over the next few months. So what's the timeline for that community engagement process? You know, what communities, in addition to Grove Hall, will be included and engaged? Can you can you tell us a little bit more with respect to details on that? I, I can probably give you a quick overview. Uh, I know that we, but one of the things is that Dorchester happens to be one of the communities and where all our community uh, centers are shared spaces with BPS. We don't have a dedicated standalone facility in Dorchester. And Dorchester being the largest community of Boston, you know, to not have a standalone is, is just, uh, you know, it's something that has been long overdue and, and definitely right. is needed. And I think that you'll find that there'll be strong advocates from different points of Dorchester, uh, Fields Corner, Upper Corner, um, you know, uh, Grove Hall, and et cetera. I think that one of the things that needs that, that I think will be happening under the leadership of, of Chief Irish is really making sure that that study continues its process. I think that we had began uh, the process, but then we had, we, we, we hit this pandemic and then things, the gears slowed down just a bit. Um, but I, I feel that once it gets the momentum going, there has to be a community process in regards to what that that, that Dorchester location is actually going to be and where it's going to be mounted. And I think that one of the things that when you look at even the Burke High School, it's so heavily populated with many partners and many programs, um, you know, that I, I think that there's also an opportunity there to kind of look at how the high school itself lends itself to some of the needs in the community too as well. But I think that the process with the feasibility study for the Dorchester site is going to be a much broader one, just because of the figure of the fact that Dorchester is so big, and you know, and you know, and 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 would need 
uh, the additional attention and the right amount of advocacy that needs to happen from the various communities that are all looking for that Dorchester site uh, uh, to open. And um, and Mike was right. And, and you know, one of the good things is that it's still there in our budget. So that means it's still going to be hopefully be rolled out and uh, and, and 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 hopefully uh, that initiative will, will take some steam now under uh, commission under uh, Chief Irish uh, direction. I, I will say, um, you know, I'm all for even creating more than one site in Dorchester, just given how large the neighborhood is. Frankly, I have lower mills going all the way through Grove Hall. Yep. And so consider me uh, an advocate for more than sure. one site, because I'm sure as we go through this process, we're going to see that we're going to need that. Yeah. The Burke is doing some incredible work for sure. But the challenge with the Burke over the years, and this is even when Dr. Mack was there, yeah. Um, she didn't even have control over her own building, like when she could open it. That was an ongoing conversation with BPS yeah. on just, you know, school leaders having control and authority to open their building for community purposes. So youth are not, you know, if you were not a student, for example, at the Burke, very difficult yeah. to get into the Burke for programming. And we do know there's a large population of folks in the Grove Hall area, just given not just the school age uh, young people, but also young people in general who are uh, non uh, school age, or frankly, not enrolled in school. Um, so really want to think creatively. I also know this includes parks. So is BCYF talking with parks? Is parks talking to BCYF? Yeah. And if not, okay, because that uh, also is a, is a part of the conversation with the lots that are vacant and trying to be activated right now mm -hmm. uh, as maybe a possibility of doing both green space and youth center or something uh, more creative based on what the community is pushing for. Yeah, yeah. We we like I said we 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 always in, in conversation with parks because we uh, we you know we do a lot of programming together. B and BL being a big example during the summer, uh, you know, and then we look at some winter programming that they they have staff for and et cetera. And we have I know that that lot that what they're talking about. I think there was a community process that went through that too as well, where the community also wanted a park there. So it's one of those things that I think that. Uh, needs more facilitation on, more conversations on it too as well. Uh, you'll find, uh, uh, Councilor Campbell, that our seniors want parking. <laughs> you know, uh, one of the things about that strip down that- Yes, East, God uh, bless our piece. seniors in the cars. <laughs> and um, the seniors in the cars. So, you know, the, <laughs> our seniors want a piece of it too with the parking. Yep. Um, and so they're working on that. I will say we understand that's sort of a heat island area. So there is yeah. real conversation around how we protect against in, you know, environmental issues, yeah. but also at the same time create this space for youth. And I think there's a way to do it. So we'll convene a conversation. Yeah. We've been going back and forth yeah. with all stakeholders and we'll follow up. Mm -hmm. um, my last question before I see the gavel is on uh, just participatory budgeting, uh, particularly particularly young people and, and what just sharing a little bit more where are we with expanding that you know what information do uh the young young residents who participate in that process throughout the fiscal year you know what what information do they receive regarding the chosen investments what that process looks like and just um any app you know what's what's it look like in terms of expanding it because obviously we get great feedback yeah. with, respect, with respect to participatory budgeting and doing more I Councilor Campbell, that actually lives under the, the Department of, of uh, Youth Employment and Engagement. That's actually Rashad, Director Rashad. Oh, the one we just department. rescheduled. Yeah, yeah. Okay, exactly. so, so I will, I will follow up there. So you can follow up with, with uh, at his hearing in regards to that question. Will do. And I'll then, let him know it's coming, though. <laughs> yes, I know. We rescheduled it and looking forward to it. Um, but I, I will push the growth hall again. I mean, I think part of the not part the frustration with community is just how long it takes right to get uh, things done and to to build something um and to respond to a need that the community has lifted up i mean i took years just to transfer the vacant city-owned parcel from dnd &D to parks right and which is ridiculous i think we all agreed and so i'm uh, looking forward to convening that meeting to see how we can move along on, a, on this project in particular in grove hall while of course expanding bcyf sites throughout dorchester and how we can use maybe some of the federal dollars right mm -hmm. to help in some innovative and imaginative ways to help the department and your department uh, do just that so thank you guys and your team i think there's a gavel uh, waving. Um, I'll be respectful to my other council mm -hmm. colleagues. Um, thank you again to you and your team and look forward to uh, circling back real soon. Thank you. Appreciate that. Great. Thanks so much, Councillor Campbell. Um, next up, Councillor Mejia and then Councillor Baker. Councillor Mejia. 
Yes. Uh, good morning, all. Um, uh, so I just kind of want to uh, piggyback a little bit on some of the questions that Councilor Campbell had, specifically in regards to Grove Hall. I grew up in 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 the Dorchester area, and um, I, I do believe that we have an opportunity to serve the residents of Grove Hall. Grove, excuse me, Grove Hall. So I'm really advocating as an, I, I know I'm not the district counselor, but I am a district four resident. Um, and I am advocating and, and, and supporting um, a Grove Hall site. I think that the residents have been on this for a long time. And I, I definitely do believe that there's an opportunity there to honor, um, to honor their request. So um, with that, I just have a few questions. I'm curious about, um, it's great to see programming created specifically for young girls. I'm curious to see how we can build off of that to include programming specifically for other young people such as LGBTQ plus youth. Um, what programming exists, if any you're thinking of. Uh, the other question is, is the document also says that we will work with the city of Boston's language access coordinator to expand translation and interpretation within BCYF. But I'm curious, what would that process look like and what options do people who speak um, languages other than English currently have access to BCYF services? Um, and will we still include, a, a, so sorry about that. Can you um, also provide a brief update regarding the Madison Park BCYF um, location renovations? How have we been adding capacity to other nearby locations to help sustain the need in the community? And lastly, what is the plan to continue to offer technology services throughout COVID, um, hotspots, Wi-Fi, et cetera? And thank yeah. you so much for all your hard work. All right, uh, in regards to Madison, there is no renovation happening in Madison that I'm, that I'm aware of. Um, you know, it, it's there. Um, in regards to expanding technology, I think that you're going to see that if the federal dollars come down, that's what we're going to look at, trying to make sure that we can really out, out, uh, better outfit our sites uh, with the technology needs that they may need, uh, so that this way, if anything comes down in the future, we'll be more than ready and more uh, 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 able to continue to serve uh, those young people. And uh, what was one of the, I, I, you gave me a, ram, a, a good ramble of questions, I'm just trying to hopefully See which one was the other one that you mentioned. I got the technology. Yeah, um, I got the Madison. Yeah. So I'm just curious. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. I'm curious about um, programming for LGBTQ youth. LGBTQ. And then, yeah. And then I'm also curious about the language access. Okay. And in regards to language access, I think that we continue uh, to work with the city's language access coordinator to make sure that everything that we have um, is uh, reflected to the communities that we serve. But I think that one of the things that the city also learned about BCYF is that we have also a robust team of individuals here who also have that language capacity. And it's also thinking about how do we pull our own teams together to help to support and communicating to those constituents. And BCYF being one of the most diverse departments in the city of Boston, uh, we're going to continue to hopefully uh, take the strengths of our staff to continue to hopefully work with the language access coordinators on making sure that whatever we produce, whatever we, we, we generate, well able to serve and, and and as you know we have everything from ESL programs that operate in our in our in our facilities um, to also uh, adult high set programs and each of those are always met with uh, individuals who might have some language barriers but we always provide some language access opportunities for them and in regards to LGBTQ let me get back to you on that because the reality is you know we have communities that, and we do have young people and we do have groups. Uh, they self-identify in, in that capacity, but in our facilities, no one's ever turned away, regardless of whatever uh, their sexual orientation or or how they identify as. You know, everyone's sort of always welcome. You know, you're a member of our facilities, um, and so our sites are always uh, inclusive of all. But I'll get back to you more uh, in regards to see what sites might be doing something specifically. I um, mean, regards to that, but I don't like you know clustering kids together because. They, they, you know, they, they're, they're in a particular group. I say we need to be a very inclusive organization and where we're teaching young people how they understand the differences of others because in learning the differences of others, they become better individuals. Absolutely. I, I totally agree. Having worked with young people my entire career, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. I guess the question was really yeah. since you're creating uh, youth 
programming for girls. Just yeah. curious if you were thinking about other groups as well. But um, just just for a point of uh, clarification on the website, it says that uh, the Madison Park site is closed for renovation. So that's probably where, um, in, you know, in prepping for this hearing, we um, got our, our research from the website. Um, okay. but it says that it's closed for renovations at this point. So we just wanted to get an update yeah. on that. Um, and then one last thing that I'd just like to um, talk a little bit about is, uh, do you guys have, I know this is not about employment. You guys are specifically just the sites, but I'm curious what opportunities exist, if any, to partner up with Madison Park around um, whether it be working with young people to design. I know I, I participated in some of your programming last summer where the young people were creating and designing their own sites. Mm -hmm. Will we be seeing more of that, um, yeah. creating opportunities maybe to even partner up with Madison Park? I know they have a culinary art um, program where they might be even be great to use as a vendor to make cookies for the sites. Like what opportunities are you looking to uh, tap into to help support Madison Park? That, that sounds, I mean, that sounds good. I think uh, I will note it. I will uh, work with our programs team to see what collabor collaborations we may be able to form with. Yeah, and you're talking about their uh, sort of, cul not the culinary arts, but the the whole side of Madison Park that's more doing sort of the trades and the culinary arts and that aspect yeah. of it, right? Okay. Yeah. Not, they, they Madison do, Park they... is also the high school part too as well. Yeah, no, I'm talking yeah. about the vocal yeah. tech, like where they yeah. have students who are learning how, how to cook and bake, and they also have cosmetology, they have a media art. So yeah. I just think that the more that we can collaborate with Madison Park and tap into all of the great work that they're doing there to help support, even if they can do a commercial for you all, just I think that there's ways for the city to be more interconnected with all of the rich resources that we have. So it's just something that I just wanna just plant that seed so that maybe you all can figure out how to, to make some of those things happen. Yeah, and, and I'm pretty sure that we have students from the school that are attending our sites for other supplemental mm -hmm. programming and where we can we can think about that. Uh, yeah. I know that we've, we, post-COVID, we were also uh, working with the, uh, uh, we, were, we were looking to start working with uh, uh, Boston Arts Academy because we know that young people want to show off their work and we have beautiful lobbies that sometimes can be decorated by some of the artwork or uh, performances or even the spoken words of some of the students in that school. Um, but, you know, it's one of those things that hopefully we're going to rehatch. I think that under uh, Superintendent Caselius, she sees a lot of the low hanging fruit at some of the BCYF centers, especially some of the share spaces on how we may be able to even deepen our, our, our commitment to young people together. Because uh, yeah. if, they're, if they're feeling it at school and they're feeling it in our BCYF centers, then our kids are definitely going to be feeling great about themselves and what their outlook for their future is going to be. Thank you. And then one last yep. question. Are you guys thinking or, or are there any programs that are intergenerational since, um, you know, it's youth and families? Do you offer any intergenerational programming? Yeah, I think something like Family Gym is intergenerational. Uh, we also have worked with the uh, uh, the Boston Arts Commission and where we had uh, resident artists that come in and always challenge them to make sure that whatever they're working on, uh, I mean, one example came Vine Street, that there was a, a sort of a, a program there uh, that was designed around hand sculpture. And it kind of gave an opportunity for young people and some of the uh, active older adults, I don't really call them seniors, right? The active older adults, you know what I mean? to have a dialogue around where their hands have been, you know what I mean, throughout their history. Um, and so we always are encouraging opportunities um, uh, that, that are uh, multi-generational. Uh, and uh, and I think that, I think you're gonna find that more because one of the goals that we're, we're looking at is really looking at how we expand more senior programming. But at the same time, one of the great things about our seniors is that some of them are former retired school teachers, some of them are former business leaders, some of them are former entrepreneurs, you know, sometimes the skill sets that, 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 that they've acquired over their lifetime are the things that our young people need uh, to listen and, and, and touch and have access to. Because uh, sometimes when they think about an entrepreneur, they think about somebody big, you know, Jeff Bezos. But the reality is the guy that runs the barbershop down the street is, is a much uh, viable option for them to connect and, and, and learn from. Thank you so much. I see the gavel and I'm yep. really encouraged by all your work. Thank you. Thank you. That's all for me. Thank you, Councillor Mejia. Uh, next up is Councillor Baker, and we've also been joined by Councillor Ed Flynn, who will be after Councillor Baker. Councillor Baker. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm kind of multitasking here. I'm not, I'm, I'm, um, 
doing the best I can. Will, how are you today? Thank I'm you for the good. work you do in, in, in Boston Centers for Youth and Family. Will, I just want to get a, a sense of what the reopening will look like for the for the centers and, and specifically, you know, I think about the the Murphy, the Leahy Holler in there, like so so pools. I know, I know your focus will probably on the be on the outside pools, but do we have a plan in place for the uh, the those centers that have indoor pools? Will we be able to open those this summer? Or um, if you can talk about that a little bit. Sure. Um, right now, we are working through some contingency plans in regards to our summer pools. Uh, I think that we're just like other other partners that have pools, the YMCA's, the uh, Boys and Girls Clubs, and uh, even private facilities. I think that one thing that we're struggling with is that when pan the pandemic hit, the American Red Cross, who certifies individuals for, for, for lifeguard, right, changed their format. And because they couldn't do the hands-on touching stuff, you know, some guards have chosen not to recertify. So it's taking us a process of trying to hopefully bring people along. We have developed a lifeguard institute, so hopefully we can get individuals in the door and be able to hopefully get them recertified in time so that we'll be able to open our pools. Uh, we're working, and, and Pat may be able to share a little shine with more light, but we're also working with, uh, with uh, Boston Public Schools because the majority of the pools that you're talking about indoor are actually facilities that are majority owned by the Boston Public Schools. We actually just manage the maintenance of the pool, the chemicals, make sure the pumps are working. But the reality is that there's a crack <laughs> on the floor. It's something that they pick up and hopefully take care of. And we've been also working with ISD uh, because there are also some state regulations that are regard, uh, that, are, that uh, have to be met to make sure that our pools end up being operable. And of course, our concentration are going to be right now at the outdoor pools because after they sat dormant all winter long, you know, you never realize what's what's wrong with them until you start trying to get them to be reopened. And sometimes we have to actually deal with the systems in that regards. Uh, but we hopefully hope that as the restrictions continue to be uh, uh, lessened, you know what I mean? We might be able to hopefully move, uh, expand more of our aquatics program, but it's it's also gonna be very contingent upon how many number of lifeguards we're gonna be able to recruit, uh, recruit to hopefully meet the safety needs of each of our pools, because it isn't something as simple as giving a 15 year old the responsibility to sit on a pool deck. There, there has to be supervision. There has to be a level of experience in doing that. Um, and so we're, we're, we're hopefully working through that. Uh, you know, I mean, right now, we've been also working with the city's COVID response team to make sure that our protocols and procedures that we have in place in regards to our pool uh, meet the standards and to, and to make sure that uh, individuals who are coming into our facilities and exiting our facilities and working in and around our staff and our lifeguards are all safe because we want to make sure that the environment is safe. God, God forbid we wouldn't want anything to happen. Uh, but uh, you can expect that as we continue to build that contingency, we're going to make sure that we're going to do everything in our power to make sure that those pools are operable um, in time, especially during the summer months that we, we need them the most. Excellent. So, um, like, when we're talking about the shortage of, of lifeguards, what is it we're talking about, Will? Like, do you have a number... And if you don't, that's fine. We, you can, we can always just do a follow up. Do you have a number of like what, what we would need and then where we are? So, so like a number of, of a potential, how many people we would need to fill these spots? Yeah. I mean, we would love to always have more, right? Because, you know, one of the things that happens is that it's our seasonal rush, okay? And the reason we always hire more is because we always know that we have students who will say they're going to stay with us for 10 weeks but we only get six weeks worth of work. Yeah. <laughs> end up going back to college. And that's the reality that, that we deal with. Um, I don't know what the number is because we also have a couple of facilities that we know are going to be offline this yeah. summer. Some of them are uh, are dealing with, with major issues of leaks underneath electrical uh, systems. You know, uh, we have, uh, of course, we, we're not going to have the curly uh, beachfront <laughs> available because we're still under construction. Uh, but I know that our team is doing a due diligence. I can get back to you what the number, the ideal number will be. Uh, yeah, but, you know, yeah. One of the things that I will ask all the counselors, if you know individuals who are former lifeguards or whatever, please send them our way. We're willing to train and get them recertified. I think we're asking everybody. Uh, we're making a big push within the colleges. Uh, we found that there are college students who thought that there weren't any lifeguard opportunities because they assume uh, based on last summers and seeing pools shut down, uh, that they, they might not be open this summer. We're telling them we're open for business. So anything that can help get the word out will be great too as well. 
Thanks, Will. And I see my buddy Pat over there. Hi, Pat. How are you? We're good, Council. Thank you very much. Good. And just to kind of make a comment, I would know the answer that with a lot of these um, centers not getting a whole lot of use, are we in are we in better shape, worse shape? Were, were we able to maybe go after some deferred maintenance there during this COVID time? Like, were we able to use the empty centers to be able to get some work done over this past year, Pat? Um, you know what? I, I, we did work with BPS facilities to do some uh, to do some work in the centers. Um, for instance, in Council of Flynn's area, uh, the Quincy Auditorium is going to have some work done coming up now. Um, most of it was preventive maintenance. We did have some problems also. We had roof leaks that caused some gym problems at the Condon, for instance, the, uh, the four buckles. So that had to be fixed. So I would say it, it's nicer, be, but it wasn't because of uh, deferred maintenance. It was because of emergency work. Because oh, yeah. Of, because yeah. Of, yeah the roof leak. But yeah, and, and also in our standalones, we definitely did work uh, during, the, during the pandemic also. And again, there was that period of time last spring where nobody could do any work. But when, once the con uh, construction got back into play, we definitely used contractors throughout the fall and winter and into the spring now to do yeah. some work. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Um, thanks, Pat. I just wanted to hear your voice. You're still working uh, on my man, Michael Terry? And uh, Michael, actually, Michael's no longer with us. He's moved on to better, 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 brighter pastures. But he's okay. Right. Oh, we got okay. a good staff here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Is there such a thing? Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, all right, uh, Councillor Flynn is up next, and then it'll be my questions, Councillor Flynn. Thank, thank you, Councillor Bork. Thank you, Commissioner Morales. It's good to see you, Commissioner Morales, and it's good to good see to um, Pat as well. We played in the BNBL Basketball League together down at the Condon and the Tynan, and I can say Pat was a better basketball player than I was, so. Um, it's good just it's good to be with you both um let me start off commissioner um and i know pat mentioned it the two hundred and fifty thousand dollar um funding for the bcyf josiah quincy school is for the auditorium seating and i'm just looking at my notes to be scheduled um but tell me tell me what we're doing with the seating at the BCYF at um, Josiah Quincy. Yeah. Pat, you want to take that one? Yep, I got it. Thank you, Commissioner. Yes, uh, Council Flynn. Um, actually, we have news even in the last 24 hours. So um, what happened was that the bid process was completed and the school department came back. The low bid was 304000 on a $250,000 budget. We also put in an addendum for 36000 for brand new lighting and, and on the stage and make it nicer. And the Office of Budget Management um, uh, graciously yesterday, after, uh, was it yesterday morning or, or Tuesday afternoon, um, approved the entire $340,000. So we're adding $90,000 to the budget. The project's gonna go forward. I'm not sure on timelines yet, but we just got the money secured for the, con the low bid contractor. So it is good news. The $250,000 budget, I believe, is now $346,000 as of yesterday, about 48 hours ago. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Thank you to the BCYF team. That's that's important to know, especially as we know, during the last year, it's been a devastating year for the um, Asian community. That auditorium and that school is used by many Asian students. So I know that will be very helpful. Hey, Pat, I know there was an issue in the past on that auditorium, but more so on the on the um, what do they call it? The um, uh, the stage, but is will the stage now be ADA compliant? Yes, it should be. I, I yeah. In order to do a con uh, contract a contract project like that, which you have to one forty nine bid process, you, legally you have to make it ADA compliant. Okay. Part. Okay. Yeah, that's that's important. Thank you, Pat. Um, just going over my notes here. Um, I know you talked about deferred maintenance. There was some issues at the Blackstone, BCYF Blackstone, on maintenance issues. What do we know? Can, can I, if we don't know what they are, can I get a list of them? Um, and in, I don't know if there's if there's also plans to do any upgrades to the Blackstone, but that that facility plays a critical role in the South End. 
Uh, it's used by Latinx kids. It's used by African American kids. The cathedral, Villa Victoria. You, you don't get a more diverse group than than the the Blackstone um, youth. W what are we doing with the Blackstone to help help make services better for the for the kids? Yep, and the Blackstone is actually a, um, a ball. We're we're a ball BCYF community center, the Blackstone Community Center within a within a larger complex. We're in Building C, which is the Boston Public Schools own the facility. So BPS facilities management would do capital project planning. We do work with them on that, and we work with them in the past on the gym floor and on doing things in the building itself. But in terms of um, uh, preventive maintenance stuff, they, that would be on their end of it, BPS facilities management. However, um, we can get a, uh, if we have a list together, we'll get a list together from the community center side. But usually anything we have in Building C, I can say that BPS facilities management, we have a great relationship with them. And I mean, I have all their cell numbers. They all have my cell number. We talk, you know, weekends, nights, so it's not like we can't talk 24-7. And um, we, we, we'll, we work together, right? I mean, we just got something this morning about an AED, so they're already working on it. An AED beeping. Sounds like a little thing, but when you hear a beeping noise all morning. <laughs> no, that, no, thank, thank you, Pat. Um, two, maybe two, two, two brief things. Certainly the Curley Recreation Center, obviously a lot of funding is going into that. Thank you. I know the plans are moving forward, uh, progress is being made. Some residents asked me to get an update on the trees that were re removed. I know they're going to be replaced, but can you just get, can you just highlight to me what the process is of replacing the trees? And if there is a community process of replacing the trees, um, just make sure that I, I can be included in it. Um, yep. Um, yeah, uh, Council, but actually, uh, ironically, the trees were removed last November, and mm -hmm. people started talking about it in the spring. I think it's just because of the weather. But, I mean, in terms of that, there was always a deferred plan. There's going to be all new plantings there, all new bushes and trees. Um, I can get you the plan. I can definitely get you more information on it. It's, uh, I know the PFD, Scott Dupree, the PFD Capital Project Manager, and Sue Rice, uh, her, her supervisor, already worked on getting an answer back. But we can get you definitely a, a, a look at the plan. It won't be a whole community process, but I mean, the planting will be nicer. It'll be all new. And um, we're not just leaving it outside with nothing. Yeah, everything come, everything down is going to come back new and nicer, better. The Condon Community Center, um, is the pool bro is the pool still down? Yes, uh, the pool is down because and we've been working with BPS Facilities Manager for uh, the last year, and, and that's something actually for Council Baker also. We definitely do defer maintenance during the pandemic because there is an electrical issue down there where the power source and the pool uh, water are sort of, it's something that should have been done a long time ago, but we've used the pandemic to sort of do the bigger project. So the pool itself should be back online in terms of getting ISD Health in and, and all the uh, regulatory people in probably by next month. So when will the pool be fixed? Actually, fine. There's no, the pool itself doesn't have the pool. The, the repairs were done on the pool, but now we're doing the the electrical work to the power boxes. Oh, okay. So, so I'm hoping that by I think it was they said late May. I can get you a better update though, Colonel. So no problem at all from the BPS. Okay. The and I think someone mentioned that I I, I think maybe it was you, Pat, or maybe it was you, yep. Commissioner. I yep. know um, I think it was the Commissioner. Um, lifeguarding issues. Um, you know the Condon, the Condon School. Um, the BCYF and the Condon, you probably don't have a more diverse group of people, young people that use it. You, you're literally, literally located in a public housing development, um, high Latinx, African-American, white, um, Asian. Um, I've mentioned, I've mentioned before the services support, but I, I, I want to say this in the, in the right way, but what type of what type of um, education lifeguarding opportunities are there? Not lifeguarding opportunities. What type of um, teaching young young children uh, um, communities of color about water safety and and learning to swim? That's that's an important issue. It's an important issue to my constituents, especially. In the communities of color, I want to make sure that they have the same opportunity to learn to swim as as other kids. 
Some people in my neighborhood have the ability to go to the Boston Athletic Center, which is which is private, uh, for swimming lessons. I, I and I took my kids there. I had the money, and I I taught we taught them how to swim. Other kids don't have that same opportunity, and they rely on BCYF to teach their children how to swim. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, I would like a plan. I would like services for uh, BCYF to teach young uh, kids, communities of color especially, on water safety and in learning how to swim. Yeah. Uh, uh, Councilor, I, I can tell you that we do have a Learn to Swim initiative. You know what I mean? Uh, nothing is more important if you know anything about uh, if, if any uh, in communities of color. They're most impacted by drownings because yeah. of the fact that uh, they uh, normally they, they live in 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 the, in the inner and boundaries of the city. They're not on the shore, but kids are just like regular kids. As a father of five, you know what I mean. Uh, you know, every time they saw the water, they make the mad dash. But we do have learn to swim initiatives, uh, and with the through the learn to uh, swim initiatives. We uh, work with our staff, work with those young people to then think about looking at like competitive swim and then into our competitive swim program. Given the year that we've had with the pandemic, it was really hard to, to even do any of those programs because of the simple fact that they will mean that you have to make contact with an individual. And if you remember at the beginning stages of this, we didn't have a playbook. We just didn't know how people were contracting it, how they were getting it. Uh, even though there were CDC guidelines that said, you know, you're in chlorine water, you might be less accessible. We just didn't want to put anybody in risk. I think that when we are finding ourselves back more in a operable kind of uh, phase that we are a little bit much more comfortable, that's always going to be our priority. I think that one of the reasons we find ourselves short a little bit in lifeguards is because we haven't had our regular population of kids who continue to come in year in, year out, day in and day out. And then we push them to make sure that they go back and get their lifeguard certification so that they can be ready to work for us. Uh, but you can you can count that that's a big initiative for us. Um, you know, one of the things that we missed last year and what we missed this year was our big city, uh, our big citywide swim meet mm -hmm. uh, that didn't happen. And, and, and that's a big uh, uh, gap. But I can tell you that um, our leadership here does a lot of that work. Jeff Mackey is one individual that does a lot of water safety trainings uh, for our guards and for our leadership in, in the aquatics program. And uh, one of the things that we're even going to do is hopefully push aquatics even much more further and looking how we may look at consolidating some of our practices so that this way we can streamline and provide more opportunities for young people, especially in the schools where, you know, the kids in the condon, you know, we can get convinced BPS. Hey, if kids don't know how to swim, let's make it a, a, a situation where one of their periods could be actually learn how to swim for their own safety. No, well said, Commissioner. Thank you. Yep. Um, thank you for that commitment. Thank you to the BCYF team. You guys are doing good work uh, throughout the neighborhoods of Boston. And I just want to say thank you and looking forward to working with your dedicated team throughout the city. Thank you, Council Buck. Thank you, Councillor Flynn. Um, next, we're going to go to my questions, and then I will, because we've had three members of the public who have been patiently waiting, I'll take public testimony after the first round. And then if any councillors have second round questions, if you can just raise your blue hands or let me know on text or something, just so I know. Um, I, and yeah, so that's the plan. So just letting the public know that um, I will, after my questions, I'll take the three folks who are in the waiting room. Um, Commissioner, first of all, thanks to your team for sending over answers to a bunch of my questions. I appreciate that. Um, and uh, I, I wanted to, and I was, I was particularly gratified to learn that um, BCYF has been working with the, um, with the YE participatory budgeting around um, that media center for the Tobin lower level. Um, yep. I'd love to just get a little bit more understanding about where that is timing-wise. Sure, Patsy. You could you could share a little bit more, Pat, on that. Um, it, it's I think it's our media program you're talking about, right? Yes, Is it Tobin. It, it's called the Future Media Center. Yes, uh, yeah. yes, it's it's something that the what it is with the youth participatory budget is they they pick what they want, and then that, that's sort of what they want downstairs. So we're going to do it in the lower level. There's some rooms down there. There's rooms for the computer lab, and then there's the other Celtics area. There's two rooms that are sort of a little bit older, and we're trying we're trying to look at whether or not we're going to build it out. Uh, we got to, we're at the point where we're ready to bring a designer in and look to see if we're going to build it out and build a bigger media center. Try to have it sort of a media center that also does some jobs training for, for uh, teenagers 
and uh, maybe get some involved and bring people in from the local universities or the Honeywells of the world that, that can come in and talk to them and tell them different things. Got it. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I've been in this space, you know, obviously really admire what John Jackson does with all of our youth. And I know that, um, I know there's been a desire to renovate down there uh, and would love to just make sure if we're doing it, that we're sort of like, we're doing it up to the most useful standards, right? So, yeah. and is yeah. there still a thought about having a sort of 3D printing aspect in there or is that separate? Yes, there is. Yes, there is. And John and, John and his staff, John and Andrew, uh, uh, Drew have been involved in the, in the process with us, with, with DYE and, and my staff. And now we're getting ready to stop bringing, the con uh, bringing in the designer to stop peace. Yeah. Okay. And, and I and I think, uh, uh, Councillor Buck, I think John already has 3D printers in there. Yeah, I thought he's he made, might. He's made yeah, some he cell phone does. cases for me, so. <laughs> that the kids designed and gave to me, so. Great, yeah, no, just thinking about how to make that as yep. as sort of useful and, and interactive a space as possible. Obviously with, you know, with Wentworth, with Northeastern, with all these the places nearby, we do want to do more leveraging of those relationships for our youth. Um, yeah, and I'll just say, you know, the Tobin's the only um, BCY up center in my district, um, much like Councillor Braden, most of my district is without. Um, and it, it, I mean, it's led to private solutions, the Hill House um, organization that sort of serves the Beacon Hill West End world. Um, but uh, it, is a, it is a regret of mine that, um, that we don't have more of a footprint in the district. Um, and, I think, and I think that's felt especially keenly in, within the district in Fenway. Um, because we've got a growing number of families there, um, lots of lots of young families there, and the same, and like we're really feeling like not having a school, not having a BCYF, like that infrastructure. I think Hill House has kind of filled that space over and uh, in the eastern side of my district. But um, just articulating that as something, I mean, it's also a conversation I'm having with with BPS. But I think as we think about um, as we think about BPS's footprint in the Fenway where you're about as far from an elementary school as you can be in the city, um, it may make sense to talk about BCYF stuff too. So just sort of putting that on your distant radar. Okay. Well, um, and then and then I guess just like, this is a little bit um, kind of a conceptual question, just thinking about, so I had also asked about the Hennigan, it's in Councillor O'Malley's district, um, but uh, you know, many of my constituents from the back of the hill utilize it. Um, and, and you guys had said in your replies, as with a number of things, well, this is technically a BPS facility. And so, you know, they sort of manage the facility side and we manage the, the programming. And um, and I hear you, Will, talking about sort of um, uh, the superintendent being ready to, you know, look at these with new eyes, which I think is great. I guess, but it seems to me like historically overall, part of the problem is like when people think about capital work, like, they always think first about their core business. And it seems like we've got a tricky mismatch here where BPS owns a lot of our of our BCYF facilities. But like if I'm BPS capital planning, like I'm gonna start with classrooms and instructional space. I mean it's just like and you know like and the stuff that we use every day all the time. Yeah. And so I just it feels like it was interesting to me to see how many of the facilities that counselors were particularly asking about were those shared facilities. And I think one of the things we always worry about with budget oversight with everything is like the stuff that falls between the barrels, right? Like the stuff that's sort of like um, nobody quite owns it enough. Um, and so as a result, it like kind of gets passed over. And so I just, I, I wanna push you a little bit more on kind of um, where we are and what you think the strategy is for making that kind of not the dynamic for our BCYF facilities for the coming decade. Because BPS announced a very ambitious capital plan last night, um, which we'll be discussing with them, you know, in the weeks to come. But even that, like that very ambitious capital plan is gonna take a lot of money and a lot of debt. And it's, and it doesn't involve touching a lot of these spaces, right? So, so I'm just, I'm sort of curious if you could talk yeah. a little bit more about the partnership sure. and strategy there. And, and that's great, uh, Council Bog. I mean, one of the things that I did when I uh, assumed the role here as commissioner and speaking to our team here, one of the things that was long overdue needed was a strong MOU that really positioned both of us to work with one, one another and not look at ourselves as silos. 
And I think that there's been a history of a lot of departments always working in silos. And I think uh, by you know the past administration, Walsh's administration, and now the Janey administration, this need, and, 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 and given the pandemic, we demonstrated how working together has been better for our city. And so we are in the process now that we actually had a signed MOU right at the beginning of the pandemic. We just couldn't ex execute it fully because of the simple fact everybody went remote. So it was really hard. I think that with the new current MOU is going to provide an opportunity for us to look at those big bucket areas, right? Looking at opportunities and where uh, site leadership from BCYF and site leadership from BPS are really talking to one another to think about what are the benefits of us doing programming and supporting our families um, uh, in, in a way that they've never been supported before. So that we are very much, uh, very be, become very much more intentional about understanding what's happening in the school day so that we could be more supportive at the end of the school day with our students. And one of the other areas that we've always talked about was the facility aspect of it. Um, and it's about making sure that those spaces are one that look equitable throughout our RBCYF networks, right? If you look at our BCYF standalones, they get a lot of attention because they're, all, uh, they're our own buildings. But we wanna make sure that the school ones actually look reflective of that. And we have some school sites that some of the aquatic centers, some of the basketball courts look stellar to as well and, and outdo us too as well. So we have to look at it through a very equitable lens to make sure that our constituents, when they walk into one of our spaces, they're getting the same warm, kind of spaces uh, that they're needed. Uh, one of the things that's happened a lot is that especially this given year, since we had to continue to run programming, we have had deepened at least better our relationships with BPS in regards to who we communicate, how we communicate, how do we move forward in different plans? Because as you're very much aware, they also follow not only state regulations, but they have federal regulations when it came to COVID. And sometimes those regulations impacted how we were going to deliver our work, but they worked with us to figure out a way that we may be able to deliver it uh, moving forward. I think it's still going to be sort of a work in progress, but we hope that with the new amendments that we made to our current MOU, there's going to be much more intentional uh, 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 opportunities for leaderships from both sides to come through the table more frequently to talk about these bucket items so that we're able to address them. Because at the end of the day, when the constituent comes to me and says, why ain't the bathrooms this? And why do they go grotesque? We're not gonna throw BPS underneath the bus. They don't throw us underneath the bus. At the end of the day, we need each other. We have standalone facilities as Pat can, can attest to where we are the athletic facility for some schools that don't have the basketball gyms. And we, you know, we provide the space for them to do the BE or we provide the uh, computer lab because sometimes their computer labs are very limited in the number of computers they have. So we know that we depend on one another and we just have to break that silo atmosphere and sort of make sure that we're working, streamlining our, ourselves uh, to be at a better place than where we are now. And, and Counselor, if I may, um, I apologize. I just want to jump in on the Hennigan because it was actually before Will's time. Yeah. Uh, but, um, and, it, and, it's, and it's probably due for another one, but back in 2008, BCYF capital budget paid $1.2 million to renovate the Hennigan pool. BPS ran the project. We 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 paid for that. We paid for it out of our budget. And again, it's it's been you know 11, 12 years, but it, it, that was in uh, 2008 dollars. And also, uh, we also put up. Uh, we did the new gym floor over and, and renovation of the gym for uh, 450 thousand dollars back around that's 2009. So again, it's been a decade. So we're not saying we're not patting ourselves on the back, but yeah. we 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 do collaborate with BPS and we do. Um, put capital budget money into those buildings. It's just, it's a collaboration where they run the project management and, you know, it, it's our finance and we're the banker and they're the, they're the, they're the, they're the construction you know, team, project team, but we uh, we just make it as a collaboration, but we don't, you know, they, they'll they tout it on their capital plan. We do also, but it's more so it's about their, making their buildings better for all of us. Sorry, thanks. Yeah, no, and I appreciate that context. I think it's just tricky because I think that what I've heard on the Hennigan is also kind of a desire to, you know, it, to re-envision it so that it becomes kind of a top of mind destination for folks. Cause I think, yeah. you know, I think we all know there are some of our facilities in your portfolio that people really think of as like, you know, as kind of, um, I don't know, like kind of like, like, oh yeah, that's a great like star location. I'm sure you guys have this with the usage data, right? And then there are places that are like a little bit out of sight, out of mind. And I think the Hennigan, has fallen yeah. into that space. So yeah. 
Um, and Hennig is dear to me. That's where I learned how to swim in 1977. So <laughs> there you go. So yeah, we needed to we needed to we need to be dear to the next generation. So yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, and um, sorry, I just lost my thread for a second. I was going to ask you. Um, switching gears a little bit from facility. Oh, sorry, though, just on the Tobin. So you're getting the designer in. When, what's the exact timeline for when we expect that there would be like an actual, like, here's the project, we're, we're bidding it out or we're doing it, when is that? Yeah, we're hoping to do something in the fall, to tell the truth. Actually, we, we, if there will be a design plot, but we're, we're, we're honestly hoping to do some type of bid, we're hoping to do a bid process by the fall of 2021. Got it. Um, and what do you guys do in terms of that like utilization question? Like, what do you do? Do you have a routine to kind of um, look at? I know you're putting in the new data management. And you're going to know more about outcomes, et cetera. But even just the old school data of like you know utilizations and whatever. And, and granted, this is not about this past year and the pandemic. I'm just talking about in general. Um, what kind of a evaluation do you guys do of like, oh, where are we seeing a lot of use? Where are we seeing less use? How could we pivot those? Because I know Councilor Flaherty also had a question that he's asked several times before. It has to do with kind of, you know, whether our facility hours are matched to the demand. And it feels like a piece of knowing the answer to that is periodically checking like, huh, like, you know, is this getting a lot of use? If it's not getting a lot of use, is there something we should be changing about the hours of the programs offered? And I'm just kind of curious what the feedback loop on that looks like. Uh, the feedback, I mean, with the old system, it's so dated that people have to actually go in and do stuff manually, right? And so whenever there's an opportunity that something is done manually, there's a widened gap that, some, that, that, that the data might not be as accurate as we would like it to be, you know? Um, so it, 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 that's the reason that we kept pushing for a brand new data system that would automatically upload, be able to make it accessible for a constituent when they come in to scan a card or something off their phone that would actually allow us to know when they're utilizing the building and what time they're utilizing. Uh, I remember a few years ago when we made the change of hours, I had constituents telling me, hey, you know, there's 30 people in the morning waiting to get into the pool. I went the whole week. It was only one person that was coming to the pool. Every, every week. And part of it was that there was this, this sort of uh, constituents perception of who was coming in, but then what was being recorded was accurate, but it was a different perception. So I think that, um, you know, that's the thing that we want to do. We want to be able to have data hopefully drive some of our decision making, drive some of our programs, um, also drive the lifespan of some programs. We might be doing programs that are so outdated that is really not serving a, 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 a good number of constituents. And because we keeping it alive for old time's sake, you know what I mean? We're not allowing a new generation to come in and fully utilizing our facilities or even giving us new creative outlets on how we can use our facilities. Um, you know, even when you look at the world of fitness, no one's really doing the barbell and dumbbell stuff. It's all core kind of work. Give them a couple of ropes, a couple of kettlebells, and that's all they need. And that's the physical fitness aspect of it. But we have to look at how our data uh, will hopefully drive our future programming and also drive how we operate, what will be our operational hours uh, given the different communities that we serve. Uh, because each of our community centers are not cookie cutters of, the, uh, of each other. Quincy might have an auditorium. John doesn't have an auditorium. <laughs> but John has a beautiful yard, <laughs> but Quincy doesn't. So we have to think about how do we best utilize those spaces um, that benefits the community as a whole. And what's the expectation for when the data system, the new one's like actually online? Well, we've been training folks now. Uh, there's going to be some other components that have that have surfaced as we're beginning to test it. Uh, but it should be it, it should be all operable by this fall. You know what I mean? Uh, hopefully, we'll transition out of our. I mean, we're probably going to keep our old data system because it takes some time to integrate the systems and to transfer things over. Uh, but hopefully, we should be having it uh, operable by this fiscal year. And then Is we'll be gonna, having some data. And is it going to affect? I think it's great to move towards things being free. Um, but obviously, the one downside of that is sometimes when things are free, it makes it harder to capture accurate data because if you used to have to have somebody, you know, pay something or swipe a membership card or whatever, and now they're sort of able to walk walked in without that, it, you can lose your ability to track. So, have you guys thought about that at all? Yeah, I mean, no matter what, we still have to have protocols that have people have to check in into the building. We have to know who's in the building. 
Mm -hmm. uh, I can't allow a nine-year-old just to walk in and not have a parent because God forbid if he got injured, we don't have the legal consent to provide any medical support to that child. And we won't even know how to communicate uh, to their immediate family members in regards to that. So I think in that aspect is great. I think that you know membership is going to be free, but there might be some special instructional, special education, whatever. They might have a smaller fee that's associated with it because sometimes what happens is, as you much are aware, John has a council here that provides programming. So if John's council has agreed to pay for a Zumba instructor, they may be looking for a fee to offset the cost for the Zumba instructor, but still provide that need to the community. So we still will be able, there still be sort of a monetary collection of fees. It just doesn't go to the city. It goes actually to the council, but then we'll be able to track individuals in the registration process so that we can know uh, that, that that program uh, has X number of members, right? We can know in that program that the average age of that member is X, you know what I mean? And then we can then look at how do we formulate a better communication strategy to those populations that special that, that want that specialized kind of programming. Great. And then um, you mentioned for federal funding, you know, that because we're definitely, you know, I think all over the city right now, we're thinking about what can we use this money on that will really pay long term dividends that doesn't set us up for a cliff effect with personnel or whatever. And and you guys mentioned sort of new technology like tablets, laptops, steam stuff, robotics. Yeah. Um, and then funding for tutors, which I think is a sort of personnel yeah. thing, but it's a surge, right, that we know we're going to need to do for learning loss. Yeah. yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that category of stuff? Is that stuff that you've, obviously there's going to be a kind of um, a whole interdepartmental conversation, but is that stuff you've started to express? Um, and then in terms of like combating learning loss and providing students with kind of support and stuff, it ha is BCYF doing anything yet? Like, you know, are we thinking about setting up spaces for this purpose in our centers? Like, are we doing anything to kind of pivot towards that, providing that support specifically? Yeah, and, and that's what we were thinking. I mean, you just said it uh, pretty good. Uh, when we were thinking about tutors and so forth, we know that during the pandemic, there's been an incredible amount of loss. Uh, we we know in, in, in our conversations with families and also in conversations with school leadership, you know what I mean? They saw that some kids have experienced a loss. We just want to be another support aspect of it. You know, I mean, more locally based uh, for for those families who might be looking for that support and get their kids back in an academic track. You know, uh, like I mentioned, I have three kids that are currently now in the Boston public school system. One is struggling academically because the remote wasn't her way of in, of, of learning. Was her was her best approach. She needed the in person. She needed the 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 that kind of attention. Um, so we're looking at what that federal funding might be looked at, but at the same time, I know that the Health and Human Services uh, under Chief Martinez is also looking at how we're also using that money to make sure that it is around a COVID recovery kind of aspect as well. So it could probably be redefined as we continue to work work through it um, and, and, and hopefully create an outline to make sure that when those dollars are used, are, are providing opportunities for for some real deep impact recovery aspect work that we anticipate that, that would happen. So when they asked us what we could do with the money, we threw the pie in the sky with tutoring, with technology, uh, with et cetera, because of the simple fact that those are the things that we experienced that if we had them in place earlier, we might be able to, we might, we might have had a deeper impact. Um, and we still need to hopefully develop further the, infra the infrastructure for technology because we know that we can also do more. Great, thanks. And um, uh, two more questions from me. One is just, can you tell us a little bit more about the racial equity and leadership process, sort of what the goals for that are and what that is? What, for within our department? To this, it's the, this is racial equity and leadership sort of described briefly in the budget book. All right, I'm trying to look at it. I know that we are working with the, uh, the administration around racial equity uh, issues, just looking within our own department. We know that when we did the strategic plan, we looked at it through an equitable lens as well. Um, yeah, it was in as a goal in the budget book, That's okay. where it was. So I just wasn't sure what, yeah. what that sort of meant. Do you know what I mean? Okay. Let me get back to you a little bit more on that. Sure. Uh, That's because fine. I think that we are actually working with the city's uh, racial equity uh, office um, and looking at 
the sort of the first wave of trainings that are going to be happening and looking then at ourselves what that work is going to be defined for, for BCYF. So it's definitely going to be sort of a, a, a work in progress because we know that we have um, some equity gaps that we need to hopefully close, uh, not only racially, but also staffing equities across some of our, our sites. Uh, but I'll get back to you in regards to that. Okay, great, great, awesome. And then my last my last set of questions was just about SOAR. Um, yep. And I was really, I was grateful for the breakdown of the um, Training and Development Institute that you guys la are launching, launched last month. It sounds great. Um, and I think, you know, things where we can actually, you know, pay our folks to get get that training and get those yep. like skills and certifications. That sounds great. Um, obviously would love to know on that sort of what the, is there like, is there a partnership with OWD? Like, how are you thinking about, is there a way that we can like, you know, if our folks get the serve safe certification or this customer service experience or first aid CPR, like how are we linking them up with jobs that might need those things? Yeah. Um, that's, uh, it's like I said, one of the things that we want to do is make sure that those can, those particular individuals that actually participate in that program are connected to some meaningful jobs, jobs that they, they themselves identify that they need. Uh, so I think that we are working, you know, with workforce development. We are working uh, with other individuals. We also work with the Office of uh, Returning Citizens, too, as well, that have other pockets of uh, uh, work opportunities. And then um, to make sure that they are linked to something that becomes the first stepping stone to what we hope will be a career ladder for those individuals because a lot of them always ask for work but one of the things is that we have to prepare them for what the world of work is going to mean uh for them and so we are continuing to broaden that aspect of it um of that work within the SOAR program uh Talia would have actually joined us but she's actually at one of those trainings today helping to be a part of that process um and she can cont continue to further elaborate more on it um, even more. So I can get you even more details um, in regards to that program from her herself directly. Yeah, no, that'd be great. I'm very interested in that work by SOAR. And then also I just wanted to hear a little bit from you about, because obviously last year's budget did include significant new hires for SOAR. Yeah. Um, and I've had the pleasure of meeting some of them. It seemed great. I just would love to hear from your perspective. Obviously it was then a very strange year, yeah. um, but kind of like you know, how, in what ways have, has, did that additional sort of building of the team achieve the new capacity we wanted? Where did it not? I know one thing yeah. I tried to do early on was connect them with, I know you, I asked a question, I, I know you guys don't have a housing side of the program, but I try to connect them up with the D and D work that's going on on informal youth homelessness and stuff since it seems yeah. connected, but just would love to hear a little bit, you know, I think as a council, we're always we're always you know being asked to fund new initiatives, and mm -hmm. we tend to talk about them in the moment of voting on the funding. But I think it's just as incumbent upon us to ask the question a year in. So how's that going? Right. Yeah. Well, I think a year in, you know, one of the things that least has happened is that uh, we definitely have uh, built up sort of the infrastructure of the program a little bit. But it's very different is that we never housed resource brokers before. Uh, strategic resource brokers, meaning that uh, these are individuals that are looking at making deep connections and relationships with uh, organizations that can support our clientele as they want to move through a healthy continuum. So I know that we've had beefed up that aspect of it. Uh, we've definitely have beefed up the, and, and well as staffing up a data analyst as well that looks at the trends of what the neighborhoods that are kind of impacted and gives us a little bit uh, of more data on how we think about how we strategically deploy uh, the soil workers in, 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 in various neighborhoods, uh, going from a very different model that we had before. Uh, I think Talia, uh, uh, Talia Rivera has done an incredible job of kind of building up the leadership team, looking at also strengthening her team's capacity on how they approach and engage the work very differently. Uh, one that's very intentional, uh, one that at, at the same time is also deepening his relationships with all the other uh, entities that kind of touch the lives of the clientele. So when you're looking at DCY, uh, DCYF, uh, DCF, you look at courts, you look at uh, other institutions that might be touching the lives of some of our clientele, it's about deepening that too as well. So one of the things that at least we were able to do is really hopefully begin to use the time to really build up the team that we really wanted uh, to have in place to support 
the street workers or the soil workers, and I keep saying street workers, but the soil workers as they do their work so that they have the support to also do the work as they go back out. Great. No, I, I appreciate that and definitely want to continue to follow kind of how the program is doing as it as it evolves and builds oh. on that base. So, yep. um, so consider me an interested party on that front. Okay, no problem. <laughs> they're, they're in the basement of the Tobin, so it's technically my district, right? Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, although I think I think the Wi-Fi connectivity isn't great down there. Um, We've been improving them. <laughs> okay, good. Yeah. Um, all right. So I'm gonna um, go to uh, public testimony, um, and then and that'll be that'll be the conclusion of the hearing, unless counselors have second round questions. So if counselors can just shoot me a note if you do, or raise a blue okay. hand, that'd be great. Um, so I'll go first to Michael Kozu, and then to Louisa Harris. So um, Michael. Coming in, and then and then I have an Anthony Meeks who I think is not testifying, but um, please be in touch with staff if, if you do want to speak. Um, Michael, thank you, uh, Chair, uh, Madam Chair, uh, Commissioner, uh, and uh, City Councilors. Uh, hopefully, you can hear me. Um, I'm here to really push again harder for uh, a Grove Fall Youth Center and expanded community center. The community center facility in Grove Fall is just one room now. So when you do, uh, there's been fundamental flaws in the planning and data collection uh, in terms of uh, basically reinforces the racial disparities that growth all young people face. So let's, let's be clear about as we follow through on this, that growth all youth center is needed in a much densely populated neighborhood. In the time I've been in growth all, there's been six federal indictments. What we're doing is without having direct youth programming, not expanded youth center, so you're reinforcing the cradle to uh, a prison pipeline for young people in terms of their options. So let's, uh, we also can look at, we utilized the Burt Gym in the past, we've utilized the Frederick Gym in the past, but both of those gyms have fundamental flaws with their ventilation. We have to jerry-rig systems when it's hot in the summertime, and clearly those gyms are not COVID-19 uh, friendly uh, in terms of, of being safe for, uh, for as, as alternatives. So again, we want to push that you have a site at 4048 Geneva Ave, the plans that you talked about, the, the uh, planning process, some of that was conducted before uh, we lost the youth programming when it got converted to a senior center. So clearly, if you did a planning process now, people would argue for a youth center is much more of a greater need. And even at that time when that discussions took place, we were arguing for it had to be connected to that need to be as recreational space connected to the um, work and to the community center at that point in time. So now that there's not a uh, youth uh, programming out of the community center, people would argue that a youth center is needed. There are no other sites in Grove Hall that is uh, accessible and uh, to all young people that would be seen as a safe haven uh, that's totally accessible by public transportation and has access to um, for young people to, to come and provide the services that are needed. So as you look at the Dorchester area, look at what all the other programs that are available to those neighborhoods, then you contrast to what's available in Grove Hall, it's, it's very clearly uh, not a comparison. So uh, again, we wanna push that uh, you, you follow through on this. One of the reasons why I was told that there's not gonna be a Grove Hall Youth Center was that, oh, the bird got renovated in 2009 for $50 million and you got the Grove Hall Library, you got you got a, a small uh, community center. That Burke renovation was 15 years too late. It should have been done in 1994. In 1994, when the Burke lost accreditation, it only got $4 million and the city provided $25 million at the same time to Latin, Latin Academy, East Boston and High Park High Schools for renovation. So Grove Hall has always been shortcut if you, if you are serious that racism of public emergency, you need to readdress the substantial disparities that's going on in terms of growth of young people and the long overdue uh, process of getting equitable resources and opportunities. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Michael. Uh, Louisa Harris. Hello, everyone. Thank you for uh, um, this time to be able to participate in this discussion. Um, Thank you for the um, attention that you always put on certain facilities. Um, 
it is uh, interesting how other facilities are completely um, not um, taken care of, not even considered. Um, Mr. Morales, you said that you um, used to be um, using the Hennigan uh, facility. I I'm wondering if you have any idea how many uh, kids, even just in the Bromley and um, uh, the other uh, part um, of this uh, Jamaica Plain area, how many kids are in the area and how many seniors? Would you have an idea by any chance? I don't know if I can ask questions. Louisa, sorry, yeah, no, we just do, we- I got you. I'm, okay. I'm happy to follow up with questions about what the BCY update is on that. But got we don't, you. We just it's more that. like, I think it's a rhetorical question because I've been using, the, I'm a Mission Hill, back of the hill um, uh, resident. And in the past at least 15 years that I've used the pool pretty consistently, um, there probably have been at most four kids in a swimming um, program in the afternoon, in the after school. I don't know uh, the school during school time, but in the afternoon, there are probably about four kids that do swimming and um, hardly any seniors. As far as the youth, I think that probably we have seen maybe 10 at most 15 kids who generally sit around in a room and don't do much. Um, I am, I think it's important. We have been trying to stress it for many years in many ways. It's important for this facility to be top of the line. You know, there is um, the VA center. There are hospitals that can use it and provide you with funding. Um, the facility is in terrible condition. There has been major problems with security even witnessed by um, a journalist that came by to take a look at the facility and reported it. While he was there, someone just entered the facility and walked out, could have snatched a kid with no problem. So we have been asking to really think about this facility because it's amazing, the facility. It can be used for many things. It can be used for workshop for kids. It can be used for art classes. It can be used for theater. It can be used for um, senior programs like, I don't know, um, Tai Chi. It can be used for yoga. It can be used for so many things um, that the kids themselves too can, can uh, participate. It's not just for senior. I know um, Councillor Bach mentioned that in Mission Hill, or at least on her district, there's not really a, a public facility for seniors, I think if I'm phrasing it correctly. But that this one can be an exceptional facility for seniors. There are plenty of people around here. And uh, at least my part of the, the Mission Hill, the back of the hill, has been growing with families. And you see them walking around back and forth. Thanks to uh, Councillor O'Malley and the work that we've done together, we, we were able to redo the stairs that go from Hayden Street to Heath Street. And you see people using it. So what we're trying to tell you, there, there is need, we want to use that facility. I'm not sure why, you know, I'm not sure why certain projects are uh, prioritized and how. I just noticed that Curtis Hall, they're doing something in the front yard when our facility doesn't even have clean showers. So I, I'm, I'm just wondering. So thank you for your attention. I am looking forward to see great things happening for the Hannington. Great. Thank you so much, Lisa. Um, and we do have one more public testifier. Mr. Anthony Meeks has joined us. Um, and then I, I will go to um, Councillor Edwards, who's joined us as well, and Councillor Clarity. Um, uh, Mr. Meeks, you have the floor. Hey, thank you. Thank you, Madam. Good morning, residents of Boston, Madam Mayor, and the city council members. Thank you for the uh, allowing me the opportunity to speak on this most vitally important matter, the building of the new youth and family center for the Grove Hall area. I am so honored. My name, as it was stated, is Anthony Meeks. I am a child of the Dorchester, Massachusetts area. I am speaking as a resident uh, at this current time. Um, I would love to validate 
um, my presence here, but it would take such a long time. And I do, I feel that there are others, even some of the city council members who are present in the chambers that could help me in that area. But I just would like to move forward. Um, today, uh, today, uh, today I speak as a resident who had wonderful experiences in a former Grove Hall Youth and Family Community Center. And it also prior was called the bubble. These places of life used to exist in the vicinity, in the vicinity of Normandy Street and Geneva Ave. One of the most important part of servitude to the people is access to a place. Some were to, uh, somewhere to engage the community and engage the people. I place youth and families, uh, a place where youth and families and the people uh, people can grow and develop in positive, transformative ways. For me, this place was the old Grove Hall bubble and the Youth and Family Center, a place where human magic, love, care, tenderness, uh, togetherness, recovery, positive development in family, and most of all, safety had happened. Fact, currently there is no facilities such as the one described above in this area, in the area that have been spoken. At least not any of them are aware of a, a uh, uh, let's see, if there is, if there is any facility, I'm not aware of it. And I'm, I'm pretty familiar with this area. This area would need a greater and a bigger a facility to hold its all the capacity the community would need. Currently, the former youth center has been transformed into a beautiful place for our dearest loves, our seniors. This place, this place is a place of connectivity, growth, love, and it is called the Grove Hall Community, the Grove Hall uh, Senior Center. I've been there inside and always felt welcome and loved by the seniors the staff, and it has provided a lot of positive development. Next, there has been and will be testimony uh, regarding the past successes and uh, documented reasons why it's crucial and crucially important to build this new youth and family center, or call it what you may. I personally, I personally live some of those reasons and some of those experience. I've heard, I've heard the stories relived, relived by many of who have benefit from these facilities. I've heard hundreds of positive stories by residents and other people, just like people here in the city of Boston, all the positive things you have done in reference or inside of a youth facility center. It was a place, it was a place where everybody knows your name and we're familiar with that with that quote it was a place where people have left great memories and dull of Joe memories and still talk about it today this was the grove hall youth center youth and family community center in a bubble i know for a fact living in the grove hall and beyond the area, i know for a fact the grove hall community center in the past have saved developed recovered and have changed countless lives in the area, including the entire community. As a resident and as a fellow, a fellow citizen of Boston, I testify to these experiences. Mr. Mr. Meeks, you just muted, but if you could just wrap up. The Newfound Family Center, which also was the bubble. And the bubble was basically the area across the street, um, it was just a tent, but it was a loving tent. The kids came there constantly. Families came there constantly. We had all kinds of uh, events there. It leaked. The kids didn't care. They came and they mopped the water up. They played basketball. They played indoor football. We had a computer lab and it was just a tiny it, as it was said, is a tiny bubble, but it was a living bubble, and everybody came there. Um, 
So, uh, so, uh, ta -ta -ta. so the bubble. I just yeah. have, I just have to ask you to conclude, just because we. Uh, we Absolutely, I am. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. So, with the community residents, social service entities, and anyone who want to offer a positive, productive outcome to the development of such pro uh, project, we will have to have open opportunities so that they can offer their recommendations and contributions in all facets of the new uh, youth center that's gonna be de developed there. There's one important point, I'm gonna skip one paragraph. The city of Boston would have uh, to do something very groundbreaking, will be able to do something very groundbreaking, creative, revolutionary and innovative human co uh, connectivity. If there is a new youth and family center built right across the street, we have the opportunity to have it right next door to the senior citizens facility. And someone spoke of generational programming, ge generational connectivity. Well, if we build a youth and family center right next to our senior citizen, I'm sure the city of Boston will have the opportunity the city of Boston will have the opportunity to create that kind of avenue, that kind of connectivity by just having both facilities right next door to each other. I would like to thank everybody for the opportunity to allow me to speak here. And I certainly hope that we will get our new facility. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for that testimony. Um, we really appreciate it. Uh, next up, I've got um, Councillor Edwards. Councillor Lydia Edwards, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Um, I just want to thank all of BCYF, your staff, and the hard work that you've been doing. And I just want to, my questions will be predominantly about my district, um, specifically looking at the different um, centers and really honestly just seeking some updates on their development. Uh, we'll start first with the North End and the Nazaro Center um, and the building of the new, uh, I guess, youth facility program or building or whatever you want to do. Uh, uh, I know we're, we were $30 million was potentially going to be dedicated to building a whole new center. Um, and then there was also a real question about what we're going to do with the current uh, gem that we have in the Nazaro Center, making sure we're still a community uh, space, uh, one that we would uh, value. And we in the North End especially want to make sure it ma maintains its community space and value. So that's one. Just some updates on the Paris Street pool in East Boston. I know we were starting to, we were going to do that last year. I, I, I don't know what delays with the pandemic had. So I don't think anyone begrudges or thinks that there's everything's running on the same amount, same timeline, but I would just love some updates on that. And then uh, just making sure I check my notes. Um, one second. The, um, with the development in Charlestown, uh, specifically the Bunker Hill um, housing development, there's going to be a whole community space that is a build out um, in Charlestown in the housing development. And I didn't know if the city had any voice or any potential partnership in that. So, um, and I'm sorry, I'm gonna go through all of them because I know I'm, I'm late. Oh, I wanted to, um, yeah, so specifically on the Zaro Center, when will the RFP be out? That might be a good um, directed question. Finally, um, I've seen an increase in, in violence actually in East Boston around Maverick Landing. And I first of all, I want to say thank you to SOAR, the Boston team for their work. Um, every time we've gotten on the phone, we've come together as a team, their expertise is amazing. And I was just wondering about additional resources or professional development in my district for SOAR and community partners like Maverick Landing. Uh, will the Street Safe grant uh, funded by the Boston Foundation um, to enhance, I think it's anti-violence measures be allocated at all in District 1? Um, and so I think that's a lot, but um, hoping to just get some clarity. All right, um, I'm gonna let Pat maybe tackle some of the facility stuff. The Shore State, you said the uh, Boston Foundation Safe Street Safe Initiative? Uh, Street Safe Grant, yeah. All right, I need to maybe go back and look at that. I, I knew that our first wave of the violence interrupters was funded through the Boston Foundation, but then that was basically integrated by the by the city of Boston and took over because it was a three-year grant. So I'll actually have to go back and talk to Talia about 
um, if this is a separate grant and what it might be specifically being used for um, in, in that aspect. I know that East Boston continues to be one of the neighborhoods that we continue to talk about, especially around uh, stronger violence intervention measures. You know what I mean? Um, it's a very unique community. It's a, it's a, a um, uh, in regards to that because of the simple fact that some of the impact players in that are sometimes are newly immigrant young people that are that are that are that are, that are uh, new to the city. You know what I mean? Trying to adapt and, and et cetera. Um, so I know that that continues to be sort of a focus for the department in regards to uh, East Boston and the work that we're doing there. And then I'll let Pat talk a little bit about the facilities aspect of it, the, the North End and so forth. I think these are all things that are gone hopefully going to be coming back online. And hopefully we're going to be uh, working with public facilities department to make sure where where those things will be moving. Pat, if you want to share more about the facility side. No problem at all. Thank you, uh, and, uh, Commissioner and Council Edwards. Thank you. Um, in the North End, we uh, the request for proposals have not been done yet. Um, however, we do have money in the FY22 budget to start the process uh, for the for the new building of the community center, which is the location is going to be where the current uh, BCYF Marabella Pool is uh, located down on Commercial Street. The Parks Department just finished a $14 million project with the Pablo Park, which looks fantastic. So I think we're going to slow down onto that. And then uh, there has been no final decision made about the Nazaro. I know there is a big push to keep the Nazaro Community Center building uh, by all ages, but especially the seniors. Yeah. And uh, they run a nice program. I know them all very well. And several of them have my phone number and my cell number. So they call me <laughs> whenever they need down in the North, uh, North End, so directly. Uh, so they're wonderful to deal with. So uh, the North End, we are definitely, the money's in the budget. It is definitely, uh, uh, there's money in the FY22, though, to start that. RFP process, and we'll work with PFP. We've already had discussions with them about that in the North End. In East Boston, um, I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry, you have any questions about the North uh, End? Sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> in terms of the RFP process, you know, I think that would be one of the better, uh, one of the better opportunities we have to build community. And so, uh, you know, that the community went and engaged with the Boston um, School of Architecture and had graduate students come over and did a whole community kind of process design of a community space, not expecting obviously for you guys to take that as full on absolute, this is the design done by, you know, your professional folks for your, you know, absolute. But but I would love to know that that is looked at and might possibly inform your RFP yep. or, and that before and, and when the, actually not, not before, but while the RFP is out, that there's a, a, maybe a community check-in to talk about that uh, because I mean, if the RFP is dedicated toward a community space, that's really important for me. If the RFP isn't, then then I really am concerned about the city's commitment. Nope, absolutely. And uh, during the study, we had three community meetings, and I believe we I planned remember. at least at least two or three more for the design project. I do know about the Yard Institute also. Um, the design people did get that during the study, and actually we incorporated some of their ideas into some of the proposals that we did. So. They were definitely looped in and we'll continue to loop them in. I just, I know that it's a matter of getting a, a, a project manager assigned and then we'll probably start the design project and, uh, process in FY22, which is RFPs as part of the design process, but there'll definitely be community input during that process. And um, I think you're going to go to the uh, pool. <laughs> yeah. uh, yes, Paris Street Pool. Uh, that project's been actually underway since last fall. So we're, we're in the construction over there and uh, and we're moving along. And I believe that the construction, that's an $8 million project of the Power Street Pool following the $13.1 million project across the street at the Power Street Community Center. So, uh, which is completed and opened up and been serving food and, and other things uh, daily. But the capital project at the pool should be finished. We're hoping by the end of the year and uh, to get that reopened up for, uh, for, for the year 2022 during FY 2022. Okay. I believe Charlestown, I know you mentioned something about the Bunker Hill housing development. I know that the city had input in that. I believe that the BHA may have made a decision. I'm not hundred percent sure. We can check to maybe go with a local nonprofit because they do have, we do have the community center right across the ball fields on right. the other side of Charlestown High in the athletic building. Uh, we are also doing the study in Charlestown though to build a standalone new community center so that's it. We've already had a community. Uh, we've actually had one community. I believe your office was represented. We had one community meeting on that mm -hmm. virtual and more coming and uh, to pick a location and to build hopefully a new community center in the coming years in Charlestown also. Would that be incorporating 
the golden age and our youth as well? Are you looking to get rid of the golden age? Nope, absolutely okay. not. And actually the golden age- <laughs> My seniors there would also be asking that question. No, that would never happen. The golden age okay. is the senior center that we have a uh, great relationship <laughs> with. And uh, Megan does a great job over there. And actually the golden age is actually owned by the BHA and wind management, the property itself. So. The city doesn't even have the right to, to uh, we can close it, but we don't have the right to do anything to it. So, but uh, but we definitely would have something where it's a collaborate with the seniors and the, uh, we were talking about connectivity with the age groups. Any type of community center would involve the seniors maybe coming over in better days where we can get them into a van or a mini bus and move them over to the community center and work with the kids. Because, you know, they, you know, they do have life experiences that I think are relevant and important to, to, to the youth of the city to learn. Mm -hmm. Of course. And, um, oh, gavel so soon. <laughs> gavel and, and raised eyebrows, Councilor Bach. I see. <laughs> well, you know what? Very well. I will. I will just follow up an email. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I wouldn't read anything into my facial expressions. Um, uh, all right. Uh, Councilor Flaherty, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I'm always happy to yield my time to my district colleague from East Boston, Charlestown on the North End, if she has an additional question. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair, and uh, to Commissioner. And it's uh, it's great to see you guys. Always great to see PMAC, uh, my neighbor, uh, one mm -hmm. of the unsung heroes of Boston Centers for Youth and Family, who mm -hmm. learned everything he knows from my former Chief of Staff, uh, Bill Doherty. So um, uh, great to see you, PMAC. And uh, I want to just touch base, uh, getting a lot of uh, calls and, and emails uh, from uh, my constituents and, and, and friends and supporters in Grove Hall for a youth center. Um, Tony Meeks knocked it out of the park. He's out there. He's doing the work, and he outlined uh, the reasons for it. I my I date back to Grove Hall during the Safe Initi Safe Neighborhood Initiative days when I was an assistant TA and uh, working with folks over there to try to um, increase uh, opportunities. Um, and uh, you know, with Sister Virginia and and, and Brother Charles, and uh, there's just so many folks that uh, were over there that uh, just did great work. Um, so anything we can do to kind of get. Uh, uh, a youth center for Grove Hall in the queue uh, would be appreciated on this end, and uh, we'll continue to advocate for it as their at large counselor. And then, as uh, PMAC can attest to, if it wasn't for folks like the the late great Anna Cobb uh, or um, Helen Alex, um, Kathy Davis, uh, Injun Horan, um, you know, uh, Mr. Costello, uh, Mike Farmer. Uh, Joey, uh, Joey Curran, all those folks played uh, instrumental roles in keeping kids on track or uh, mentorship or almost like a big brother or a big sister. And that made the, the difference in so many lives. So the role that youth and family plays uh, in sort of nurturing um, our youth um, and, uh, you know, future leaders is, is, is tremendous. And so the more of that interaction we can have with our youth across the city, I think we'll be a better city for it. And so anything we can do, and I, I've always had this issue, and I know Commissioner uh, Morales we've worked on it in the past, is just making sure that the hours of operation, and I know that I submitted those in our initial working session, but just making sure that the hours of operation are sort of uh, are conducive to the hours that our youth in particular, but also our seniors, the ones that uh, that have our senior centers, that um, they kind of uh, coincide with uh, sort of the, that routine, that schedule. And uh, we had a situation uh, under a previous administration, under the Menino administration, we had, um, you know, youth and center families were, uh, uh, the workers were leaving uh, as the kids were showing up. And that's never sort of a, it's not a good look, number one, but two, it, to make sure that doesn't work. So, so making sure, again, our hours of operation, and particularly during the summer months, uh, you know, making sure that the facilities are up to snuff and that the pools are open and that the you know, the gym facilities are open and that we have programming. Uh, it's one thing to have a physical structure in a gym, but if there's no organized sort of leagues, if you will. So, um, and again, that's going to be, um, you know, that's up to, to, to you folks to sort of do all the planning and, and it's up to us to make sure you have the resources to make that happen. This summer in particular, obviously, unfortunately, we're expecting or at least people forecasting that uh, it will... Uh, it may err on the side of uh, of, of of being uh, busy and um, um, and there may be some violence. So we want to try to cut that off as quickly as possible. So getting our centers for youth and family up and running earlier, making sure that there's programming, exp expanding the age uh, uh, potential as well to kind of capture some kids that um, if there's no programming for them, you know, it's just a matter of time till they uh, 
you know, if, if, if this expression when we were kids, if, um, if you don't find trouble, trouble will find you. And so uh, anything we can do uh, to make sure that we're, uh, we're up and running, um, particularly as uh, you know, school season ends, there's always been somewhat of a lag in our city where things usually don't start. You know, the red shirts didn't start until July, et cetera. We need to start our programs as quickly as possible, get kids engaged, uh, get them involved in leagues, um, and, uh, and do what you guys do best, which is again, the stuff that, um, the folks that I mentioned, uh, that I grew up with, the PMAC grew up with that were game changers and they change lives and we want that to continue. So appreciate the work that you do. You have your hands full, but, uh, make sure that you're letting us know, um, how your facilities are and, uh, what needs to be in the capital pipeline and, uh, and a, uh, last ditch uh, advocacy for a, a youth center in Grove Hall. They deserve it over there. And, uh, and the folks that are over there on the ground doing the work are also advocating as well. So thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor, I mean, Commissioner Morales, did you have any comments in response to that? No, I, I, I have to thank Councillor Flaherty, especially when uh, pre-COVID, when we were looking at having the community meetings in uh, South Boston, uh, the fact that uh, he's a native and, and son of South Boston, uh, supporting the work, supporting the direction that it was going in, especially the support that we needed to make sure that uh, we ended up getting the additional resources uh, we needed for that building uh, was instrumental. And so, and, and I support uh, some of the other councils too that supported it too, uh, Flynn, Councilor Flynn too as well. So, um, uh, it, but, you know, we are doing our due diligence. We do want to definitely be back at work. I think that, you know, we are a department that signed up to help people and that's what we're eager to do. And we want to be, be back to helping people in the capacities that we've always done, uh, but at the same time, taking new tools into the trade uh, to further expand our work. Great, thanks so much, Commissioner. Um, Councilors, uh, Braden, Mejia, Edwards, Flaherty, um, who are all still on, if any of you um, do have a follow-up question, comment, Councilor Edwards, if you feel you were cut off, speak now, <laughs> or else uh, we're gonna... Hello. <laughs> I'm good. I'm okay. good. Okay. All right. Um, uh, all right. Well, seeing none and seeing as we um, heard from uh, three members of the public already, um, and grateful to them again for their comments, um, I think that we are ready to adjourn. So with that, this hearing, the Ways and Means Committee is adjourned. Thanks so much, Commissioner and team. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.